everybody. Welcome to tonight's town council meeting. It is September 11, 2017. We start, as always, with the Pledge of Allegiance, moment of silence. We will also be taking a moment of silence for 9-11 and the victims of the recent hurricanes. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item two on the agenda is public comments. Mr. Bear. I'm the heavy tonight. You got four minutes. I will let you know four minutes. I will give you one more minute. So you have a total of five. Four minutes and then you got one more minute. Oh. He's letting them know. Oh, got it. The warning city. Uh, 87 portion. Joe. Members of the committee, Mr. Mayor, good evening. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Joe Quarante. I own Advanced Construction and Tree Removal. Uh, I'm here tonight to bring two donations before you. Um, the first one is for uh, tree and brush removal for Treasure Park. I think the uh, committee may have discussed this with you already, um, but uh, <clears throat> I offered to uh, remove select trees and brush in the effort to make that uh, more usable. Um, that donation will be in the amount of $60,000. Um, and I understand that uh, Chris Bruzzi and um, J.C. Merritt, um, Jason, is it Jason Merritt? I forget his first name. Jeff, Jeff Merritt. Um, they're down there uh, removing some invasives, and once they do that, then they'll notify me and we'll uh, move to phase two, which would be tree removal and brush removal. Uh, the second one is for um, tree removal and brush removal for the uh, Old Boardman Bridge. Um, we haven't quite figured out exactly what will be removed, but when we do, um, those trees will be removed. Um, cut down, chipped, and, uh, and the wood will be removed in an effort to um, improve the aesthetics of the bridge. Uh, and that donation will be in the amount of 30000 Any questions? That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for uh, allowing me to speak tonight. I'm Sean Emmons. I'm your contractor for your tree removal for the town of Milford. Came here today to finally speak about the tree program that the town has in place. Recently, I decided that I wasn't going to bid the town, and it's mainly because I need to speak tonight. So, When the town hired me in February 2016, you became my customer. You also became my fourth municipality. I treat all my customers the same, whether they are residents or governments. My goal is to give them the highest level of tree care done in a safe and productive way. I also save them money when I can. What you guys didn't know when you hired me is that you guys got put in a very, very, very big database that I run for my municipalities. It gives you a breakdown of how much you spent on each road, how many trees you cut, what kind of trees you cut, and where you can save money. Since I took over the contract, we have removed 463 trees in 53 days. We responded to 21 emergency calls in 32 hours. We had a total of 10 pruning hours. We removed 148 non-billable hangers and deadwood from the road, meaning we don't get paid for it. If we're taking down a tree and we see a hanger, we swing over and we take care of it. Something that cannot be charged in a per inch category. 
Some factual information for you from February, February 16th to June 2016 in the per inch category, you spent $67,797.50 in 22 days. From July 2016 to June 2017 in the per inch category, you spent $120,058.75 in 31 days. $8,055 of that was a capital project. $6,270 was emergency work. From, June, from July 2017 until now, we spent a total of $14,580. You guys have been told numerous times that the emerald ash borer is affecting your tree budget. That is not the case. You guys are affecting your own budget by the per inch category. In our time frame, is the emerald ash borer here? Yes, it's in town, but it's not your problem. In our time frame, we've taken down 223 maple trees, 112 ash trees, 25 elm trees, 19 birch trees, 18 pine spruce and hemlock, 15 cherry trees, 10 poplar trees, 5 hickory trees, 2 box elders, 2 oaks, and the 5 lovely willows on Young's Field. This list gives you a general tree work of the trees removed and it comes to 436. There was 27 trees on the capital project that brought you up to 463. I decided not to opt out or opt out of the bid so I could talk tonight. I also opt out is because that bid is horrible. It's costing the town money. You guys for some reason switched the stump grinding over from per inch by the hour. No big deal you guys don't really do a lot of stump grinding. But everybody's harping on lowest bidder, lowest bidder. Well, you got somebody that comes in with a 100 horsepower grinder for $100 an hour. You got somebody that comes in with a 25, 30 horsepower grinder, $50 an hour. Everything's fine and dandy, and on paper, they're going to go with the lowest bid at $50 an hour. Bring it out to the field, that 100 horsepower just became your cheapest price. In 2005, we used to have a $100,000 budget. We had two contractors working for the town in Milford. Two of them. You guys never went over budget. Never. My proposal to you is to take this per inch category, throw it out, and go by the day. You guys are losing money by the per inch. None of my other municipalities do this, and they know this because they don't, they don't know what's out there. You don't know what you're going to be taking down. You don't. You could set a number on it, but you guys blow through that number like it's water. A per inch category works like, say, Newtown. They give you a set amount of trees. I got 100 trees. Go look at them. Give me a price in a per inch category. That's how they do it. You're running your per inch category like you're running your day rate, and it's costing you guys money. Just close up if you can. Thank you, Sean. Just recently, Carlos spoke in front of you all. I have included the list in your information packet of the trees that he was talking about that have been marked for months and months out there. <coughs> your marking is so out of control, you don't know what's out there. A few hours, a few years ago, I fought an, aud an ordinance against trees. You can, you can finish later. It's going to take me about two seconds. Just I fought an ordinance about trees. I told you that there was trees marked out there from years ago. I caught a lot of heat from it, and I took a lot of slack from it. Being your contractor, I've taken down seven of those. Just recently, I took down a tree on Summit Street that's on your list. Here's your tag. From 2006. I hope you guys understand what I'm talking about. Do you have any questions tonight? I'll be sitting right over there. Thank you, Sean. You will. Thank you. I'm going to go road to Irene. I'm sorry, pardon? I'm going to go to Sean. What do you guys have to say? I'm very Fair enough. I'm sorry. I mean, as much as I want to hear from Sean also, we, we do have to keep it to the, um, to the people. I know, I know, but everybody then, somebody could talk for 30 minutes that way. Yeah.
He's going to come back. We're going to invite him to speak, you know, at the trees when we're talking about the trees issue as well. Michael Barnes, 17 Sullivan Farm. The mayor has previously used town council meetings to attack political opponents and innocent members of the public, but he has sunk to a new low by scheduling an agenda item to politically attack someone. The mayor was quoted in the paper saying, if this and if that and if a councilman voted on something in the future, he could be in violation of the ethics code. That's a lot of ifs to have the council be involved. It's very telling that the mayor has used his lawyer language and only called it a conflict of interest in the agenda. He knows the difference. I find the mayor bringing a conflict of interest without his target present before the council outrageous because our mayor not only has his own conflicts of interest but has acted on them to the detriment of the town not once, not twice, but three times. The mayor was previously involved in a court case against the lowest bidder for the town tree contract. He refused to recuse himself from the process and has refused to grant that contract three times to someone he has a personal grudge against. It is, he is very lucky that Mr. Gentile loves this town and hasn't sued us already. Frankly, it doesn't get much more unethical than using the power of the mayor's office to attack political opponents in town meetings. To make the ethics situation even worse, Instead of waiting a few weeks for voters to decide who will be on the next council, the mayor wants to fill the seat with his buddy who had a serious ethics issue in the past. He also wants to appoint another buddy as town attorney who is currently involved in a legal action against the town. You can't make this stuff up. The propaganda arm of the mayor's campaign, a.k.a. the Danbury News Times, ran that one-sided political attack on Councilman Esposito without getting his response. I'm not surprised because they also did such a good job making Chamberlain's resignation look like nothing that a national paper asked the mayor if he was discriminating against him over furry suits instead of graphic porn endorsing rape, incest, and even circumcision of dog boy hybrids. If the council takes action on this sham, it will speak volumes about the values of some members. Frankly, I am disgusted with the negative way this council has been used by the mayor, and those even discussing this before hearing from the mayor's target should be ashamed of themselves. Thank you. Good evening, council members, mayor. Um, I'm here to beat the uh, tree contract yet some more. Could you just um, say your name and address, please? Carlos Carada, tree warden. Um, I want to just give a brief overview because I know I, my time is limited here. By the way, that's not the tag that we use for trees currently. But, um, in any event, um, 2016, uh, we put out bids for trees, and the mayor decided not to accept the low bidder. Very, um, in my mind, no legitimate reason given. Um, basically, some inferences about overbilling and so forth, none of which was ever substantiated, and I take strong exception to. Uh, Mike Zarba and I, Mark, Mike is here, your director of public works. There was an investigation. Nothing was ever produced that verified any sort of overbilling. Not a penny more was spent than what was authorized. Okay? So we don't go with the low bidder. We're going to spend thousands more on tree work. We get to the point that the bid expires and we don't rebid it. We wait six months. We're now into July, this most recent July. Bids are received. Again, the low bidder, Sam Gentile, is ignored. We're not going to accept that. We're going to rewrite the contract. And to Sean Emmons point, it is probably the worst written document I've ever seen. Um, somebody wrote that that not only doesn't know anything about tree work, they don't know anything about contracts. Um, putting us all in a very bad spot. Now, I've been before you 
uh, before trying to illuminate the fact that when you have trees that are tagged and they sit for months, four, five months, there is an extreme liability in doing so. You've identified the fact that you have a tree that poses a danger to the residents of this town and you're sitting on it for an amount of time that no one, no reasonable person could defend. Uh, the mayor seems to think, well, there's no liability associated with that, and I take great issue with that. If the mayor's children were hurt by a falling tree that had been tagged for months, I have a feeling the mayor would take issue with that, as would any other parent or resident in this town. Okay, So now we're back to a point where the mayor will not accept Sam Gentile's bid and wants to rewrite it. We open the bids. Sam Gentile notwithstanding, you know how many contractors bid on that? Zero. None. And I predicted this way back when you made this fabricated story about overbilling. I said this is going to create an environment where contractors do not want to work for this town. Okay? And Ms. Lundgren's letter to the paper once again trotting out that ridiculous uh, fabrication that the town had been overbilled when she knows or should know that it is completely false is a disservice to everyone. And I think you personally need to decide if you're going to be a politician or a leader because that's not leadership. Okay. Now we're at a point where I can no longer do the job of tree warden. This town is blessed with beautiful trees. It's a big part of our character. But unfortunately, many of those trees are declining and they pose a threat. And I need to go out there and based on my 30 years of experience as an arborist, I need to try to make a decision as to whether or not we can leave that there and enjoy it for a couple more years or have to take it down. That's not comfortable because I can't always be right. If you do that a thousand times, you're going to be wrong. And you just heard some of the volume that we do, okay? To not have a contract in place, a mechanism by which we can address these trees is unconscionable. And frankly, the reason that we don't is because of a personal ax that the mayor is trying to grind. And I, that, thank you. My, my opinion is that the record is very clear. He has done everything he can to sabotage this contract so that Genteel Tree doesn't have a part of it. And it is unconscionable. We're in a, you have driven this program into a ditch and it is going to be increased cost to us and increased liability. And number one, it's going to be an increased risk to public safety. That is your number one priority. If it's not, it should be. Do you have help, please? Okay, so I live at 15 Park Lane West. Um, I'm here to speak about the so good that the mayor... just give us your name and address. Yes. 15 Park Lane West. Okay, sorry. I didn't yes. Hear you. Thank you. So I'm here to address the good that the mayor has done. Downstairs in the hall, there's a, um, a sign that says that the mayor saved $111,000, and it's to do with some, I don't know, equity. Um... I'm not remembering the number as to the amount of money that the mayor has saved the town, so I applaud that. Um, I was here to speak about the issue of um, wrongdoing by a council member to not go through protocol regarding what needed to be done with the library. Um, the issue of ethics has been an, an issue that's been going on in this town for a very... Okay. Ms. Davis, okay. just address the All right, council, sure, please. sorry. Thank you. Be, um, so, it's a problem. I'm here today and I'm hearing all this anger that's being addressed by, all the, by people right now. I mean, we're here to talk to our council people. The two other times that I spoke, I spoke about civility. And here, it, it, the, you can talk, you can speak to people, you can address your wrongs, but you don't have to do it in a way that's accusatory. And that's, what, that's what's happening right now. So there is wrongdoing going on. Making special deals is not right. Um, and that's, that's what I say. So I want to thank the mayor for the good that he has done. So thank you. Thank you, Cindy. John Payne, please. 
John Kane, 7 Crossman Road. I just would like to speak to the ethics issue. Uh, we have to move on, be, uh, move beyond parochial or self-interest over the good of the town. One way we do this is by immediately adopting uh, a model ethics code put out by the state of Connecticut. I understand it is out there. It eliminates gaping holes in our current code, allowing for political players to be seated on commissions. In my rather extensive experience with the ethics code and commissions, I've come away with a couple of points. People and commissions, uh, commissions should be peopled with neutral people who are not actively serving on town commissions or political town committees. That seems to be common sense. Um, I've also had conversations where I was really convinced to using the clergy uh, on the uh, commission, on the ethics commissions, is a good thing. They generally are trained in ethics and do not have a monetary interest in the outcome of ethical deliberations. Our charter demands a review of ethics on an annual basis. The model is out there, um, and the people of New Milford, uh, the council, we're spending their money. I know I do not invest in a brokerage firm without clear knowledge that there are sound and ethical rules in place, separating profit from the broader interest of my investment counselor. The same applies here. Uh, its review and adoption, as I said, is demanded by the town charter. If there would be a modern, well-run municipality in the 21st century, there is really no choice. Thank you. Jackie Baroy, um, Putnam Road in New Milford. Um, I don't really know how to voice this, but I'm concerned about the commitment all of us have to our community. And in this time where everybody is so divisive, I don't know how we can accomplish anything. Because heads are going up and people are getting angry and that is not an environment where anybody can accomplish anything. So um, I, I just want to speak out uh, it, pertaining to the vicious attacks and, um, and just bad information. It's, it's very hostile, and it doesn't have to be. I mean, if we think about the town, we think about the people in it, it doesn't have to be this way. We should be committed to a higher power than that. So... That's my opinion. I'm pretty upset about that, so I'll just be quiet. Thank you for listening. Adrian Riccio, please. Uh, good evening, Adrian Riccio, 72 Chernisky Road. Um, I'd like to say this, I'm here to discuss uh, the councilman who was accused or allegedly accused in the newspaper for ethics violations. Unfortunately, he's not here. I don't know anything about his personal life. I know people are grousing and complaining that because he's not here, no one should say anything, but that's not my issue. Um, number one, I think Mr. Barnes, who just spoke earlier, I think he should recuse himself from any discussion about Mr. Esposito should this come before ethics because he's on the Ethics Commission and he's already commented on it in the News Times comment section, so he's already biased. Um, I don't know if Mr. Esposito violated anything. What I... What I only know is what I've read in the paper. That's all I know. It doesn't sound good to me. It sounds like he used his position to try and uh, give his company and himself an advantage on something that would happen with the library. And that's not good because we already have a lot of people in this town across the country who don't have favorable opinions of government or elected officials, all of you. And that's a bad thing because we're not getting along. Everybody in this town is griping. They're on Facebook calling everyone names. I've been attacked. I really don't care. I was bullied as a child. So to me, it's cyberbullying, sticks and stones. Call me what you want, but I'm going to say what I feel. Um, and from what I've read, there isn't enough evidence right now to say one way or the other if Mr. Esposito is guilty, but it should go before the Ethics Commission. We should find out because we owe it to the people. If he's guilty, then he should resign. If he's not guilty, then he has no problem. But if he used his position to gain advantage for his company, that's a violation. And it's what causes people 
in this town and everywhere else to say they're really sick of government. And that's a bad thing. You know, we all need to get along. The public is very suspicious of everyone. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Lisa Hida, 11 Buckboard Lane. Tonight, I'm going to change the subject from our earlier conversations. I'm going to ask the town council to table the request that's on the agenda for additional appropriations for the renovation of the property formerly known as John Pettibone School. I do this not because I'm opposed to the idea of a community center. I'm not. But because I believe as stewards of our community, it's up to us to make sure, number one, we as a town can afford it, and number two, that we design it the way the taxpayers want. This is really important right now for a number of reasons. Our grand list isn't increasing. That's not new news. There's a high degree of uncertainty how much funding we're going to get to the state from the state. Um, I've heard a number as big as $10 million worth of cuts. That's not insignificant. School enrollment is down, causing further concern about funding sources. We borrowed $14 million in April to cover capital expenses and ongoing costs that were already incurred. Other hard choices were made in the budget. Nonprofits were cut by 30%. The question is simple. How much is this project going to cost our town in total, and is it appropriate for this time? Right now, we've spent, um, as far as I can tell, $394,500 have been appropriated for a project that was touted, I believe, earlier this spring to cost $100,000 or less. So specifically, I'm asking town council members, represent me, represent my interests, and interests of like-minded taxpayers such as myself. Tables of appropriation until we have a comprehensive design, a total project cost for the entire building, a complete timeline, a study of the economic impact to the Village Green and the downtown businesses. I don't believe that that has been done. A project justification that's up to date based upon departmental space needs and future plans. For my corporate life, we would have never considered a facilities addition without looking at the space needs and requirements, not just for the current year, but for five and 10 years down the road. And last but not least, significant outreach to receive community input. And here's what I don't understand. We know how to do this. It's the same thing I said to the zoning board six weeks ago. We as a town know how to run this process. The library expansion is a great success story. There was a process, there was a design, there was community input, and everybody's rallying behind us. So we know how to do this. Tonight it might be easy to view me as just one voice, or to believe the headlines. It's Republicans against and Democrats for. But here's a little snippet of data. In going door to door for the 240 signatures of registered Democrats that I had to get to petition to be on the ballot, 45 to 50% of registered Democrats are unhappy with the way things are running. Unsolicited feedback. And for those of you that don't know, my background for most of my corporate life was product management and product marketing. My market research tends to be pretty much on the target. Think business to business marketing, not business to consumer. So multi-million dollar projects, three to five year time horizons. If we got it wrong, I and my team, people lost their jobs. Here's another snippet of data. Some of you may recall that the mayor and I had a difference of opinion on how the community viewed Panda Power. We exchanged emails, we exchanged letters to the editor, he expressed to the press I was one of a vocal minority. As we know now, I was not in the minority and at that time, I based my position also on my door-to-door -door conversations. So again, I implore the town council, table this request and any others until we know the complete picture and what it's going to cost the town and the benefits. There's two sides to everything. But please represent myself and like-minded taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Carl Dunham. Uh, good evening, Carl Dunham. I live at 195 Kentwood Mountain Road in New Milford. Uh, I predominantly want to speak to what's on your agenda, namely the Amoresco project. Uh, it's never been taken before this council uh, as to whether or not they favor the project or not. There was a lot of discussion tangentially about the pilot, uh, and even in that discussion, there were comments made that this doesn't mean that I'm in favor of the, pro of the project. Uh, you are our representatives. From your standpoint of representative government, short of a town meeting, you pretty much speak for the town's people. Uh, I would like you to acknowledge your position with respect to this project. When the time comes uh, of the 
of the agenda when it comes up, I think each one of you should state whether or not you're in favor of it. And the reason why I say that is this is a changing situation. In the last six months, all sorts of things have changed. First, first thing is you have now some information. You can look at the Connecticut Siting Council filing, where it's a petition, 1312, and you can virtually see a lot of data about this. When this was before you, tangentially, on the pilot, none of that data was that extensively presented. So I would suggest to you, anybody that has a question, that you educate yourself, and you take a look at that, and you look at the interrogatories, and you look at all of the elements. As far as I'm concerned, that item, which is on the agenda as the last item, honestly is the most important item you have here tonight. That project is going to be a problem, as I've told you before, to take down 68, now it's 72 acres of trees, and to stump all that area is unheard of for any project. And what's really bothering me, I can't figure out, we've gone ahead and established that we're a party as the town, but I, for the life of me, can't figure out what our position is. I called town attorney, and I asked him specifically, and I was told, you're not a party, I'm unauthorized to talk to you, talk to the mayor. I've gone to the mayor's office and asked for an audience, and I was told maybe on the 14th. I've asked him to call me, he has not called me. So I don't know what's going on. And what really bothers me is there's a lot of science involved in this, and yet we've not secured any consultants whatsoever. Any project that comes before this town through zoning, wetlands, or anything else always has consultants. You have no consultants. I don't believe it. I don't know what you're going to do. And I was told before, in the tangential issue of the pilot, we're going to be protected, well, I'll take care of you. Well, I want to know what's going on. I filed an FOI matter last, on Saturday, basically out of frustration that I couldn't talk to him. So I don't get what's going on. But I'll tell you, you guys better stand up and be counted on this issue because you're going to have a problem when it comes down. Uh, I'll note a few things that have changed. The Connecticut legislature has come out with a policy now about locating these facilities. What happened was there was no policy at all. Now, if you look at the legislation, the legislation effective today talks about, this is not, these areas are not favored locations. Core forests, farming, very interesting. The Department of Agriculture on the state level is filed as a party to try to go against it. Similarly, DEEP has filed as a party, which is unheard of because of their issues. The Council for Environmental Quality has written criticism as to the quality of the assessment. I'm telling you, you Four need to... I have one more minute? Good. So I just think it's time for you people to stand up as our representatives. The Zoning Commission has done that. The Zoning Commission has spoken on it. So I just trust that you will be our representatives, and I would like to know where you stand, because the election is coming up, and I will take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Peter Mullen, please. Uh, good evening, Peter Mullen, 64 Old Ridge Road. Um, a few issues I'd like to broach tonight. Uh, just a little under two years ago, I had a conversation with Randy DeBella, the previous town attorney, and we got talking about what a town attorney does and what works for the town. And in that conversation, he made a recommendation that an in-house town attorney is really the way to go for this town. Uh, it would save money, it would be more efficient, and would deal with issues on a more timely manner. So I hope that goes through tonight. Um, concerning uh, that solar um, project that's on the last thing of the agenda, I, I do just want, to, um, just want to bring up one thing. If anyone's done any work for that company, surveying or anything, I hope they recuse themselves from any discussion. Um, I also have a point about the ethics commission in this town. My reading of things, elected officials aren't supposed to be on the ethics commission. If you're a member of the RTC or the DTC, by state law, you're an elected official. 
So I don't know what elected officials are doing on the Ethics Commission. I wish the town council would look into that. Um, another point, you know, it, the simplicity of it is, is odd. When somebody says the low bid wasn't accepted, it's not that simple. Whatever job you take on, it's not so simple as, oh, this one thing is the answer. It's far more complex than that. So if anybody says, well, the low bid wasn't accepted, there might be a hundred details to that contract. So to make your argument say a low bid wasn't accepted, well, probably not, because it didn't happen at Lindemic Park, and look how nicely Lindemic Park turned out. We had people that did the job properly. So that, that's, a whole, that's a whole other issue. Um, on my eight years that I sat at this table, there was never any discussion about trees. It never came before us. What was bid, what was spent, not once. It was kind of hidden in that public works uh, budget. Not once was there a presentation. It's very disturbing to hear now about how much they're concerned about it. We spent $4 million on turf fields and we can't spend one-tenth of that for a community center. Seriously, folks? To table that community center right now would be foolish. It's totally positive. The return on investment is enormous. To sit here and say that we have to study it again, that's killing the project. You want to study it? Study it, study it. You kill the project. That's the only point. You spend four million bucks on two turf fields, you can't spend one-tenth of that to do a community center. That makes no sense at all. You want something that the people want? Get yourself a community center. Last thing, again, in my eight years, I never saw an agenda this large. I never saw leadership take on this many issues. In my eight years here, it was hidden. There was no transparency. I'm glad to see it now. For once, I would write down what actually I was going to say instead of just winging it. Uh, Andy Grossman, 13 Hilltop View Road in uh, New Milford. Uh, I wonder uh, how many people here might have uh, noticed there was a, a thread on Facebook uh, today where somebody talked about the need for civility uh, in our politics and, and in our town. And, and I thought it was highly ironic that this thread then descended into the usual name calling that you usually see on Facebook. Um, I, I agree with the sentiment that, as, as, as Jackie said, that, that uh, uh, things here are certainly in terms of, 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 of name calling and, and it is, is certainly been worse than it has been in a long time, but it's more complicated than that, than just saying we need civility, uh, geez, we shouldn't say bad things about each other. Uh, this is the first really contentious election we've had in, in this town, uh, it, it, and, and it's naturally. Politics, is, is, is famous saying is politics it isn't being back. Things are going to be said. Uh, in politics, uh, as we've, we, 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 we've seen tonight. Uh, the only thing I would ask is that um, these criticisms be based on facts, okay? Facts, evidence, okay? Not unsubstantiated unsubst uh, broadsides and groundless charges of the sort that we see in letters to the editor and on social media. Things that absolutely have no basis in fact. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I mean, we shouldn't be naive. Uh, politics can be messy. Uh, there's a lot at stake in, in this town this year. Uh, it's been years since we've had a true two-party system in town. So naturally, it's going to be tense and things are going to be said. But there's no reason why things should not be based in facts. The issue here tonight uh, about Mr. Esposito, uh, people said he's not here tonight. Well, it's too bad. You know, he could be here tonight, but, he, but he's not. Uh, that's not really our, our issue. The question really is, is this based on fact, okay? It has nothing to do with a political attack on somebody. It's, is this based on fact? Is there any evidence to back this up? It has nothing to do with a political attack, because you could say anything is a political attack. And what we're doing tonight is to see whether there is any evidence, 
and whether it should be referred to the Ethics Commission. This is not a hanging party. We're not out here to hang Mr. Esposito. We're here to look after the facts, unlike what, what, what people say in the newspaper and social media with all these groundless charges. And here's an example of some of the groundless things we've heard. The petty bone that's coming up tonight, as, as, as Mr. Mullen said, costing one-tenth of, 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 of what the turf field would be. I've we've seen things on Facebook where people say it's going to cost millions of dollars. I saw one figure that was 10 to $15 million. Letters to the paper, millions and millions of dollars. It's not even going to be costing a tenth of that. And this is a huge resource. And somebody said, well, this town is too small for a community center. That's ridiculous. Okay? Either this town grows, either we invest in this town, and this town grows, or it dies. Either we invest in this town, we put money into this town, or it becomes like Derby, and it becomes like some of these other Naugatuck Valley towns, manufacturing towns that shriveled up and died. We need to invest in this town. The mayor has been investing in this town. And I applaud the mayor for investing in this town. Is he a perfect mayor? Of course not. He'd be the first to say that. Has he made mistakes? Of course he's made mistakes. He's learning on the job. We understand that. This is his first term. Okay? We all understand that people, everybody learns on the job. But the money he has saved for this town, the things he has done for this town, is, 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 is some of the, 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 the accusations that have come out about him without any evidence, without any proof, in newspapers and social media, is outrageous. And I advise people to make sure when they look at things, to make sure things are facts, make sure there's evidence. Okay? And Mr. Barnes, he's talking tonight, it's a basic strategy that goes back to Watergate. Attack your attacker. Okay? Instead of speaking to the facts, you attack the attackers. Okay? Talking about, oh, the newspaper wasn't fair. Well, the newspaper tried to contact him. They tried to get his side of the story. He wasn't there. He didn't, it, what is the newspaper going to do? They're not going to hold the story. Okay? You know, uh, uh, Mr. Kane, okay? Mr. Barnes alludes to some scandal about Mr. Kane, some ethics thing about Mr. Kane from a few years ago. Where are the facts? Where are the facts? You see, I think I'm aware of, 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 what, of, of what Mr. Barnes was talking about, and there's absolutely nothing to it. And I guess maybe Republicans on this thing will probably bring it up later. And it's just scurrilous. It's just scurrilous accusations, and it's just nothing but, 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 but petty politics, which, 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 which has been uh, here, uh, which is just outrageous. The last thing I would say is Mr. Barnes talking about cronyism. That's a laugh. If people remember our last administration, it's cronyism to the hilt. And I didn't see Mr. Barnes talking about that. Last mayor was appointing all of her friends and, 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 and people that she knew. The fact that the mayor is, 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 is appointing qualified people, that's all that counts. Are these people qualified? Are they able to do the job? It doesn't matter if the new town attorney is a friend of his. It's, is she qualified? And that's all I'm going to say. And I want to say that please vote for the community center. Quality of life is the most important thing we can do to get this town growing. The community center will add to the quality of this life in this town. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Julie Learson from 124 Graybrook Road in New Milford. Um, I hope what I have to say isn't that controversial tonight. I just wanted to say I loved seeing the barn quilt trail blocks come out on the barns this summer. And I see that uh, there's an item on the agenda tonight to continue that funding. I think it's lovely. I think it's a great way to celebrate our roots as a farming community and a way to spark interest in our town. Even my teenage kids took their heads out of their iPhones and said, oh, what's that? as we walk by a block. Um, my dog would also like to tell you that he's a fan of the river walk. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with that tonight. I would like to remind everybody here on the council and in the audience that election, election season is approaching. I'm gonna ask us all, every single one of us, to be civil. And let's be mindful that we're all neighbors. We're all here together. We all live here together. This is our town, we share it. Let's play nice. Let's discuss issues. Eleanor Roosevelt once said that the boring people discuss other people, the best people discuss ideas. Let's do that. And let's be transparent. I do have a concern about some of our social media pages um, that appear to be kind of masquerading, or not masquerading, I'm sorry. They appear as official town uh, websites, um, but they may not be run by town officials or they may be run by a few people and not a full body, but things are being posted that are unattributed um, kind of blurs the line of personal opinion and official town positions on things. I urge us all to be transparent in those cases um, because we deserve to be open and get the full information of where things are coming from so people can separate fact from opinion. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Good evening. Jeff Winter, uh, 22 Maury Road. 
It's been quite a discussion tonight. I think we knew that before we, after we uh, read the, the agenda. And if you remember last month, I spoke about what John Cain discussed, which is the model ethics standards for municipalities and how town attorneys, that the town attorney, according to this charter, every October 1st is supposed to look and make sure that we are following the most updated ethics um, rules. Now, this has been in place since 2009. It was a long-term project through the state of Connecticut. And yet, of course, we, uh, other towns too, but we have not adopted it. But more importantly, it's never been brought up. It's time to look at it now. It's time to bring us up now. Why? Because here we go. What we can we can take dovetail just about everything said tonight and bring it back to ethics. There's no reason to make any assumptions about Mr. Esposito or his actions until they are brought out and they are fully discussed. However, there are certain details that are well known and those deserve to be discussed and they deserve to be discussed in the public forum. Public officials should not, as we know, accept gifts and personal and, and public officials are not allowed to get to essentially seek projects that will line their pockets, as it were. Now, a town councilman, acting as a town councilman, leading his boss and his company into going after a bid for a public project that he will probably earn a sales commission off of, it's worth discussing. And we all know now, too, but there are likely to be other issues of, member of members of this body that are going to come up because of ethical irregularities. Personal relationships are one of them, and how that can be used to sway projects for people's direction. That is definitely wrong by any standard. Also, we do want to talk about transparency, which is part of ethics. We need to know when town council people claim that they've spent their own money to send out a mailer under the guise of it being official, that they make it public as to whether or not they actually did spend their own money. Because if they didn't, that's known as a gift. And it could be a substantial gift of a few thousand dollars. And that would be an ethical violation. Now, under oath, Mr. Bass said that he had the receipts for that mailing in his hand. But he lost them, or he threw them away. It is very easy in today's world to dial up stamps.com and get that receipt back. If we want to have transparency, prove it. It's as simple as that. Let's take a look at this, at the model, model for, for municipal ethics and get this moving forward. Thank you. And my last comment is, is along transparency, it's not just public transparency, it's personal ethics and personal um, taking responsibility as citizens. If you're not going to pay your taxes on time, the citizens need to know about it. And we know that there are delinquencies of people running for office right now, people who want to be paid for running for office, who have not paid their taxes. And I think that should be examined, again, not as a public ethics issue, but as a personal ethics issue. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you have three minutes. Thank you, sir. Got a little out of control. <laughs> Try to fit a lot of stuff in at the last minute. 
Uh, what I did was I handed that tag to Walter and Katie. Uh, Katie expressed a lot of concern when we talked about the tree ordinance and about the trees marked out there. That tag is not a current tag. Current tags are round and circular. In your packet, you also have a tree that has a round circular tag that's been marked for a long time and it's still standing up on Upland Road. That tag is definitely from around the 2006, 2000, I think, I think Carlos will know better. Carlos switched the tags over when he took over from Phil. Uh, so there are trees that are marked out there. These trees are hidden underneath the vines. If they're marking them, they should be able to see them. Sometimes they don't see them because they're underneath the vines. So he, he can't see everything, but they're out there. These trees are out there. Within the first week, I took one down on Erickson, the one that Ms. Francis has in front of her. The program needs to be fixed. If you go to by the day for those numbers I gave you, you guys would have saved a total of $76,555.75. That's more than half your budget. I urge you to take the bids, do what you want with them, but listen to me. If you want to go to per inch this year, fine. Next year, when you put it out to bid, you need to go back to the by the day. And you need to put two contractors on because that's the only way you're going to get the most trees down. They're going to pit each other against each other. They're going to not want to lose, oh, he took down more trees than me. They're not going to want to. That's how it was back in the day. And that's how it got done. And you guys got a lot of trees cut down. The other towns do this. I'm not the lowest bidder in the other towns. And we come in. I may not get it the first time, but within a couple months, I'm back in there. That's how they do it. If they're not producing, they're gone. They're on to the next one. That's what needs to be taken care of. And that's what you need to look at. I'm more than happy to answer any questions for you guys. I'll be sitting right over there. And you can go from there. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Bear. Way up to item three. I'll entertain a motion. Let's make them go first and then we'll end. Let's do them first and then let's end them. Alright. Okay. Motion to approve the prior minutes of the regular town council. No, we're up to three. Three. Okay. Discussion and possible action to fill the vacancy caused by Councilman Chamberlain's resignation with the appointment of John Kane to fill the unexpired portion of the term. A second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, the uh, unexpired portion of Mr. Chamberlain's term is to the end of November. Section 205 of the Charter, though, states that for any elected position, the expiration of a newly person should be till the election. So I was just looking for clarification. Whatever the clerk interprets unexpired term to be, we will deal with the clerk's interpretation. Okay. It would be awkward for somebody to be appointed, though, to the election, which is November 7th, and, and then they wouldn't serve for, I don't know, three quarters of a month until the next council would take place. No. So if there's a conflict, there, there's, some, there's a strange kind of interpretation there. No, it says that the uh, Section 205 vacancies Except as otherwise provided in this charter, if there shall be a regular town election as defined in Chapter 141 of the statutes, before the expiration of the term of any office in which a vacancy occurs, such office shall be filled until the said election by appointment as provided for herein, and subsequently by the election of a person to fill that office for the remaining portion of the term, such person to take office immediately upon his election. Sure, but even if you're elected November 7th, you don't take to office until December 1st. So why should, let's say Mr. Kane at this point, but I'm just saying from a practical point of view, why would you say that he's, his term ends on November 7th, the day of the election, and then there's an empty seat until December 1st, until the that's, new electors take their seat? That's not what it says. What so that could be interpreted to say that when the electors, the new electors from the election, take office. 
No, that's not what it says. It says, until the said election by appointment as provided for herein, and subsequently by the election of a person to fill that office for the remaining portion of the term, such person to take office immediately upon yeah. his election. I understand the language. Yeah. So, Ms. Benucci. John, can you weigh in on this? Sorry. Uh, Noreen Fitzgerald, the town clerk, came into my office today and told me his term would extend till November 30th, 2017. Okay. okay. So she's the, the ultimate arbiter of terms. I I'll defer to her on that. Charge. John, can you give us a role? I mean, we're in the council, right? I mean... Basically, as I read this before, I believed uh, under the first paragraph of 205, I think the town council was within its rights to make this appointment for the unexpired portion of the term. Let's appoint him and then argue about this. As we get into it, we'll find out what the uh, interpretation from the clerk is based on. We'll look at past practice. This can't be the first time that a councilman has been replaced for whatever reason, you know, medical or anything else. And did they do it to the election or did they do it to the end of the term? I think that, but for now, let's appoint him the unexpired time uh, portion of the term. How Any many? Comment? Yeah, how many? Have we asked the public if they're interested in serving a Democrat? I think we have over 4,000 Democrats in town. I think that's inappropriate. I don't think that's an appropriate. We have a nomination of Mr. King. Do you have another nomination? Would no, you like I, to make? I, I would like to ask any, I would like to be honest, I'd like to put in the newspaper, if there's a, one of the 4,000 and something Democrats in town interested in, in filling this vacancy, I'd like to hear from them. Oh, yeah, it's that's right. So I, as part of the Republican caucus, you want to solicit who the Democrats should appoint to fill the, the, uh, the vacancy to Mr. Chamberlain. That's what you're saying. You want a say in appointing the Democrat into the vacant seat. I'm just asking if anyone else was considered. Uh, is that? I, I don't the know. DTC I, considered this, this matter, and the DTC made this decision, recommendation. And that's how the recommendation comes through. This is how it's done. So the Democratic, we have a letter from the Democratic Town Committee. Do you need a letter from the DTC? That's what we used to get from both parties. No. Yes, I don't think you ever got a letter because you weren't sitting here then. I mean, we'll, so, make, a, we'll make a yes, representation that the DTC is endorsing John Keynes. Uh, filling of the seat. Okay, well, I, I just, I agree with what everyone said today with respect to civility and everyone getting along. And Mr. Kane himself spoke with respect to ethics today. So I have two concerns. I have no problem working with Mr. Kane. He's on planning. We've had some good debates. Uh, I, as an applicant, I've had no personal issues with him. However, for some reason, he personally attacks me online for several instances. I don't know why. I've, I've never done anything to the guy. And okay, let me I get into that. Hold on for a second, Mary Jane. Regarding this okay, so regarding that you bring up Facebook King's and character. online. Are you involved with any of these? You know, some of the one of the uh, speakers talked about anonymous kind of Facebook pages. Are you involved with any of those pages? Absolutely not. I don't. I, well, there, where, where did I just write to Kate? You're not I an said, administrator on I any said, of those Kate no, pages. No, absolutely not, Mayor. What's because, the talk of the town one where they share the agenda? Town no, oh, oh, town council happening. Yeah, that one definitely. Oh, okay, so wait a second. I'm sorry. Okay. I copy it, okay. and I post it as it comes. Okay. I don't say anything. Do you post, post on there as well? Yeah, we post what's on the agenda. Do you post as Paul Szymanski, or do you post as town it council? who you are if you put something up there. I don't think I've ever seen you post on there. He probably doesn't post there. I, it's only for the agenda. It's mostly Katie. That's it. It's the agenda. What's on the okay. agenda? Because there are misleading things that are posted on that web, on that Facebook page. It's Absolutely. actually what's on the agenda. No, it's actually in just the last agenda. The agenda was posted. They actually took out the part that was uh, referenced uh, the ethical issue regarding Mr. Esposito. No. That's not true? Two agendas. I put, I put the first one and I put the revised one. I copy it, cut and paste it. It wasn't. It left out the, the, okay, the reference well, to Mr. Esposito. I'll check it when I get home. But I have no ax to grind about any of it, and I only do that as a public service. Mr. Mayor. So don't take issue with me about that. This is a Democratic sheet <laughs> that we're talking about. Last yes. time I looked. Didn't that Democratic uh, Town Committee nominate Mr. Kane? I did. And let's take a vote on this. 
Ms. Jessica, you had your hand up as well. I was just going to say, any Democrat in the town is welcome to join the Democratic Town Committee. And if they had, they would have been able to go to the vote where they voted John Cain. So at that point, anyone could have nominated themselves. And they didn't go because they're not a part of the committee. So if we're going to put John Cain's name on there, I so say we put it on there, we come to a vote. And in two months, the entire population of New Milford can vote as to whether they want John Cain to stay or they want someone else to be put in. But we just said through an hour of people telling us that we need to be civil and they want things done we've got an entire agenda to get through and I think that we should you know really argue points that are particular to that affect the town and not whether we're going to put John Kane or someone else the Democratic Town Committee voted can, can we can we please vote and get to some of the other points on the agenda that I'm sure a lot of the people here would like to hear about and at maybe 10 o'clock and not 11.30 at night. I agree. Jessica, my only concern was that John has personally attacked me several times on Facebook. That's I don't inappropriate. Really, it's not part of the question please right now. I, as a council, I would hope that we all want to work together. That's my hope. I, I believe that's our intention. So I hope that continues is all I'm saying. I was disappointed by that. If someone has an issue with me, anyone at this table or anyone in town, I'm easy to find. If you have a problem with me, call me. Talk to me. I'm sure we can work together, work out any issue. That's all I'm saying. That's how, that's how things happen. That, that's how issues turn into, non-issues turn into issues is what I'm saying. When, when people call each other and say, listen, I got a problem with you, Paul. Okay, let's sit down. Let's have a cup of uh, tea or coffee and talk about it. Uh, Walter and I are Dunkin' Donuts all the time. Okay. That's all. Okay, like Nobody's innocent here. Everybody's responsible for other things and for incivility being said against everybody else, whether it's in their own name, a Facebook page, whatever it is. But that's not the issue. The DTC has endorsed uh, Mr. Kane. Um, we've addressed the issue. It's time to call the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Mr. Kane, welcome. Here, here. Sit down. Is, that, is yep. that the end result? It goes to November 30th. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it just takes to the end of the Right. Yeah. I'm doing it right now. Just give me a second. Yeah. Just wait for them to sit down and get settled. Everybody calm down. There's a lot of angst in the air. So, Mr. Kane, do you solemnly swear that you will perform the duties of the office of town council to the best of your ability according to the charter of the town of New Milford? and the Constitution of the State of Connecticut. So help you God. I do. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Welcome to the council. Okay. Do you have an agenda? I do. All right, hopefully you do. Okay. Uh, item four, approval of the prior minutes. Okay, motion to approve. Oh, Mr. Bear, I'm sorry. In the absence of uh, Scott Parliamentarian. Right. Should we uh, take action to appoint a parliamentarian? We're without a parliamentarian now. I entertain a uh, nomination of a parliamentarian. Mr. Bass. Frank Borgo. Mr. Borgo. Any other nominations? Second. Jessica Richardson. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Borgo. Mr. Mr. Well, Richardson. Okay. Frank, do you want it? Do you want it? Exactly. No, because oh. Jessica is a lawyer. Right. I'm not a lawyer. And I never want to be accused of being a lawyer. <laughs> so I would be happy to have her do the job. But thank you, Peter. I appreciate that confidence. I think that's fair. So we have a, a motion to appoint uh, Ms. Richardson as parliamentarian. Um, was there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Ms. Richardson, for being willing to serve. It's a thankless job. Just to book your sister. And Frank, I understand. <laughs> okay. Item four, approval of prior minutes. Okay, motion to approve the regular town council meeting minutes of 8-14-2017 um, with an amendment that um, I did not vote on any of the um, items that came up on the agenda as I was chairing the meeting. Second. Or so moved. <laughs> um, so are we amending the minutes to remove you from your votes? Right, from the I votes. Yeah. Correct. Oh, okay. Um, I just have one other question. The, the item that came up about changing what was on the prior minutes 
from something the mayor had said. Um, and I came up about making it verbatim. Uh, so was that done? I mean, we don't get to see the minutes after. We make changes here, but we don't see them. So was, was that word put in that it was based upon the video and the recording? As far as that. I believe it was put in the location of the video. I don't know about the verbatim part. <clears throat> okay. Well, the video is what we really talked about. Okay. As long sure. as it's done. We don't, you know, I just, we don't get a copy of it after it's changed. I just wanted to make sure because that was something that was changed without the mayor in the room. So, in the That's town. Fine. <laughs> go, let's go to the team. Um, I would yeah. also um, like to, um, if you want to vote on that, or I want to amend the minutes again for another item. Another friendly amendment. Well, so let's vote on that first amendment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And I'd like to amend the min uh, minutes of 8-14-17 um, regular town council meeting minutes, page four, um, in the second to the last paragraph, which begins with Mr. Zemanski, where he asked um, a question, and um, in the recording after the response um, to Mr. Szymanski's question. The answer should have been, Mr. Lawson said it impacts our planning. Mr. Chamberlain asked, what if any reductions in student services occurred during the 2015, 2016, and 2016, 2017 budget while you were accumulating capital reserve? The rest of the paragraph is a response to Mr. Chamberlain's question, beginning, quote, Mr. Lawson said he couldn't answer. So it's just correcting the minutes as to um, what is actually on the tape. Question and answer. Any objection, comments? Uh, we need a second. So is there a second for that? Second. Uh, all in favor? Uh, all right. Opposed? Motion carries. You have a copy for Ms. Box though, right? So okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So that covers item four, minutes. Mayor's comments. There are a number of them. I will try to move to the, um, the agenda items along, but they are important as well. I would like to acknowledge, with regard to the ordinance that was adopted banning fracking waste disposal in the town of New Milford, it was approved on the town council on July 10th. Uh, the town attorney did recommend uh, approval of the ordinance. That ordinance was published in the local newspaper and it will become effective October 1st. So thank you to everybody that had something to do with it. It was a process when it shows up. Good things can happen. Item two. We have formed in response to a hate crime at Thompson's Restaurants a number of weeks, weeks ago, a hate has no home here group. And that group is going to meet for the first time. It's an inaugural meeting on uh, the evening of Thursday, September 14th, 2017 in this room. And I do invite everybody, it is a bipartisan issue. Um, and there was a great outpouring of bipartisan support for the Thompsons, as well as condemnation for the crime. And that's the way that a community should react to something like that. And we'd like to keep that going, keep the conversation going, and hopefully um, get some additional positive action as a result of it. What time is that meeting? Seven o'clock. Thursday, September 14th. Here. Item three. There's been a lot of talk and pictures about the skate park. Well, if you haven't been down there, and they've done an amazing job actually uh, rehabilitating it, fixing it up, and that skate park will be reopening on Sunday, September 17th at 10 a.m. And I would invite everybody to come. It's a real uh, uplifting example of what can happen when some young people, the town, and um, some civic-minded businessmen get together and made a big difference uh, to address a problem. Item four, the John Pennybone Community Center. We are scheduling a grand opening for September 23rd, 2017. That will be at 1 to 4 o'clock. And I encourage everybody to come and uh, take a tour and see all the work that has been done. So that building is opening. And, um, and we invite everybody. Again, a bipartisan has been disagreement about the Pettibone Community Center over the past year. But um, through a lot of hard work and effort from a lot of our departments, um, that project is coming to fruition. So September 23rd, item five. We did send out a press release. We hope to see this in the paper. We are soliciting the names of veterans, veterans from World War II and from the Korean War. Um, when you go downstairs, when you leave here tonight, you're going to see a, you may have, you've walked by it a, a dozen times, there is a memorial to our World War II veterans right in the entranceway uh, at Town Hall. And there are spaces after each category of names for additions to be made. 
And uh, I would thank Walter Bowden and Dan Sullivan for coming to me and raising the issue that there are World War II vet veterans in New Milford whose names are not reflected on that wall. So we want to put something, we want to get that out there and solicit names to add and update that list. And the same goes for the Korean War. There, were, there, are, there are people in town served in that war who are not reflected on that memorial, and we want to update it and make sure that that's done. Item six, HB CASA has recognized our Substance Abuse Council, and uh, I want to publicly thank our council and what they've done over the past year to not only get recognized by the uh, HB CASA, which is the regional kind of substance abuse organization, but also Jason O'Connor, who was specifically recognized and given an award uh, for his work uh, with the Substance Abuse Council. Uh, and that brings me to their next uh, event, September 28th, I invite everybody. There's a Substance Abuse Prevention Forum where the results of a survey that was conducted last year are going to be discussed, they're going to be roundtabled, and we're going to talk about the opioid and substance abuse issues that we face in town. And again, this is a bipartisan forum. This is something that affects all of us. And so we encourage everybody to come to this forum, be part of the solution, and help us um, you know, try to address this terrible epidemic that, is in our, and that, that has ravaged not only our town, but the entire region. And finally, on another positive note, the Bar and Quilt Trail is complete. It looks great. It kind of surprises you as you come along some of our country roads. The inauguration is going to be September 24th, and there's additional information on our website so that you can find out where that is. So that concludes Mayor's comments. We'll move on to item six. We have the finance department, and uh, I'll entertain a motion, and then we'll invite our bond counsel, uh, Attorney Fozzie, to help us with the public hearing as well as the resolution regarding the, um, the ambulance barn bonds. Make a motion to hold a public hearing on the proposed issuance of up to 2.2 million principal amount qualified 501c3 bonds to refinance outstanding New Milford Ambulance Facility bonds issued in 2010. Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I have a bit of a script, so bear with me here. Joe, do you want me to read the first part of it? You go right ahead. Okay, thanks. So tonight's public hearing concerns the proposed issuance of up to 2.8 million qualified 501c3 bonds to refinance bonds issued in 2010 to build the town's ambulance facility. The notice of public hearing and the bond resolution are available at tonight's meeting if anyone wants a copy. Is there a motion and a second to waive reading of notice of public hearing and incorporate its full text into the minutes of this meeting? So moved. So second. second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. The public hearing is now open for questions or comments. And just in layman speak, if anybody wants to speak towards the reissue of this bond, now is the time and the opportunity for you to do so. Not that you have to, but it's your opportunity. Once, twice, seeing no public comments, I now declare the, this public hearing closed. The next item on the agenda is 2.8 million refunding bond resolution. Is there a motion and a second to waive the reading of this refunding bond resolution and incorporate its full text into the minutes of this meeting? Move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Is there a motion, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> too many things at once. Is there a motion and a second to adopt the resolution? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> the motion carries. I declare the resolution adopted. Attorney Fozzie, anything else? Well done, Mayor. Okay, very good. <laughs> it's easy to read from a script. <laughs> I bet you did an excellent job. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Attorney Fozzie. Uh, okay, there is an item C to that, though, so I'll entertain a motion. Okay, motion for discussion and possible action on the request to transfer $1,000 from unassigned fund balance to continue in force economic development number 10490519-53401 for the Barn Quilt Trail Project. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And we will refer that to the board of finance. Item seven, town attorney, entertain a motion. 
Motion for discussion and possible action to appoint attorney Rebecca Rigdon as town attorney working as a full-time employee of the town in lieu of town attorneys Tabella and Tower of Kramer and Anderson LLP who have served the town as independent contractors. The increase in the town's legal work and the financial costs warrant transition to a full-time in-house position. Second. Okay. I'll speak a little bit to this since um, I'll give a little bit of background. So when we first presented this, this was back in um, July, I believe, I issued a, a kind of letter that said a town staff attorney is a better way to pay for legal services. And that's not uh, a knock against Attorney DeBella and Attorney Tower. They have done tremendous work uh, in the past year and a half, almost two years that I've been here, uh, and even for the period behind, be, uh, before that. But the fact is that our legal budget continues to go up and up every single year from $350,000 to over $400,000 a year. And the fact of the matter is, like uh, Mr. Mullen had referenced earlier, 80% of this work, 90% of this work can be done in-house. It's general legal counsel work. It's general practitioner work. But because it's outside of our uh, $2,500 a month retainer, we get billed for it. And John and Randy do an amazing job in trying to give us the biggest bang for the buck. But at the end of the day, it still adds up and it's still an inefficient way for a town of our size with the issues, the legal issues that we have come up every single day. And it's not fair to Attorney Tower and DeBella to ask them to prioritize what could be considered relatively moderate legal matters, but from the town's point of view, need to get done expeditiously so that the business of the town can continue to move forward. So we put out a posting for, um, for a town, a full-time town attorney, and I'm very proud, I'm very proud and enthusiastically endorse um, the appointment of attorney Rebecca Rigdon. You've got her uh, resume in your packet. She is a local attorney. She grew up here. She's got roots here. She knows the town. She understands uh, the unique nature of our town. I love that she lives here. I like that uh, when we hire people, that that salary goes back into the town and into the community. And she's a great, I love her background. She's got a great background in general practitioner law, from municipal work and doing tax appeals and land use work to contract reviews and uh, general liability issues. She's got probate work uh, to education law. So she really runs the gamut. I could say as the chief executive officer that 80 to 90% of the legal matters that um, you know, we're dealing with run in the, fall in the general practitioner category. Their, their personnel matters, their contract interpretations, their um, negotiations and their administrative um, coordination with other agencies and with the state as well. So that's a bit of a background. I'd also like to emphasize that she does have a letter of endorsement from Representative Buckby, um, and you should have that in your package as well, as well as probate judge uh, Marty Langreep. So I endorse her. She's going to, oh, we get to the, to the best part of it. So one of this is saving money. So like I said, from $350,000 to $400,000 a year we're, st we're spending on our legal budget. A full-time town attorney, her salary will be $97,000. Even with the benefits that are added to that, I believe, uh, you know, Greg can correct me, it's about $125,000. That still gives us $100,000 to continue to work with Attorney DeBella and Attorney Tower on those higher and more complex cases for which they, they, they may be necessary for and still save the town tens upon thousands of so, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Francis. Um, if we, uh, and I'm sure she's a great attorney, um, if we have a full-time attorney, we still, as you mentioned, we might need to consult with Kramer Anderson or others. Oh, yeah. Would we enjoy the same level of fees with Kramer and Anderson, they will no longer be involved as a town attorney. We'll now have a staff town attorney, right? We have a staff town attorney. Yeah. So and those anybody fees else will just be hired, as it were. Would be hired, and those fees are always negotiable. There's there's a different rate for municipalities that most law firms offer as opposed to private rates. So that's something that certainly would be negotiable, and, and I'm sure Attorney Tower 
we could um, you know talk about you know, setting that fee level. So you feel that in the in the difference between having a permanent resident attorney and we yeah. have a sufficient amount of flow there to pay for the rest. We have a su sufficient amount of flow. What we have is an overwhelming amount of legal work that is not getting done now because we have to limit ourselves. We have department heads that are afraid to call our town attorneys because they're gonna get, they know they're gonna get billed on it and it discourages getting legal advice, yeah. which leads to you know more serious matters down the road. Why, so. do have, why do you feel we have more than, I mean, you're saying more and more than we ever had before? I don't know, I can't speak to what was before. I could say that the business of managing this government is complicated. We have at least on us a forty million dollar budget. We've got two hundred and fifty plus employees. We've got everything ranging from law enforcement issues to personnel issues to contract issues to finance issues. And we need somebody that we could walk into their office or we could call them up and know that they've got one client, and that one client is the town of New Milford, and that's going to be their priority and who they put first. And it's not a knock against John or Randy, but they have multiple clients. Would, the, um, would she have an office in town hall? Would she have yes. staff? Because I mean, there's things that need to be no. done. No, I mean, right now, it's, handle... she would have an office in town hall. And we've discussed this. Right now, she's a, she's a independent, she's a solo I practitioner she is now. without a staff I as go well. I every day. Yeah. But I mean, so um, I mean, just as a matter of mechanics here, who would do her typing, printing, copying, that kind of stuff? This day and age, you know, attorneys, me and, and, and attorneys like Rebecca, we do it ourselves. Okay. I'm just curious what other things might come yeah. along. Sure, Jessica. Oh, I'm sorry. I forget. Jessica, no, you're no, here too. I, I don't know if do you have a staff. <laughs> it's real life. It's a parliamentary yeah. now. You're the staff, right? Yeah. Okay. If that's if that's the deal, you'd work with her. Yeah, Mr. Borgo. Um, this idea of a, of a town attorney. The first time I heard it was when I was on the council with Lee Firm. Wow. We've kicked this around for administration after administration. We have never pulled the trigger. The way I'm looking at it, maybe it's maybe not a good idea, but maybe it is. But we haven't tried it. Every year we default to to, to the town attorney that the, the mayor picks. But if we have an in-house town attorney, let's try it for a couple of years and see if we save money. Maybe we'll save money. We'll say, why we why didn't we do this? We'll leave a firm with mayor. I don't know why we have it, but I, I commend you for for. Bringing this forth, I think it's a good idea. It's a time coming to do it. I think you're going to be happy with it. And you know, you haven't had the chance to spend the time with her like I have, but I mean, she's a great person that I think is going to grow into the job as well. And you're going to enjoy working with her. She's going to get along really well with our different department heads and, and the various employees. So having somebody to build those relationships and establish some continuity is so important. And um, the town's really going to benefit from it. Ms. Um, and also, she's the, we're not going to be the first town in the state of Connecticut to do this. There are other towns sure. that are doing this, and um, it's working out really well for them, and they are saving a lot of dollars. And um, um, I would just like to say how much we have appreciated Kramer, Kramer and Anderson over the years, and I have a lot of respect for them, having been on the council for 14 years. I think they've done an outstanding job for the town of New Milford, and I'm ever grateful to all your advice. And we're gonna, they're going to still be here. We're still they're using still them. They're still going to be here. They've still got a lot of work to do. Mr. Bass. Um, do we have a job description? One's been drafted, but we were basing it off of the, uh, the charter. Um, uh, the charter is pretty um, descriptive in terms of the responsibilities for a town attorney. So we do have one drafted. It's been kind of, we've been using it as a model, and um, we will bring it forward you know, to the council to approve. But I think uh, Mr. Valero had drafted one to use as a model. And in your discussions with Kramer and Anderson, uh, in, when you, um, your thought process is bringing on a town attorney, when are they not going to be the town attorney? I expect her to start, you know, within a week. So um, we'll formalize the transition over the next uh, week or two, assuming there's an appointment tonight. And then did we get costs of, or a fee schedule from whoever we're going to use to do any other type of services that the attorneys that do now, because right now we're at a, at a uh, rate schedule sure. that's, you know. 
I'm sure we'll be able to work something out with Attorney Tower and Attorney DeBella. Uh, they want to continue to represent the town. We want to continue to work with them. We're not looking to get into a bidding war. And they've been incredibly reasonable with their rates already. So it's something that will work out. And, I have no doubt. And in the job description, this new employee, um, is a new employee also going to be involved in the pension? Um, yeah, every employee of the town okay. is entitled to pension benefits. And uh, according to the charter, the town attorney is covetous with the November election? Sure. So her contract is going to be... No there's, no, there's no contract. She serves at will like any other department head. So if you'd like to replace her in November after two months, you're free to do that, I suppose. I think it would be a mistake. The whole point of this is to establish some continuity and not have uh, the scrabble for these huge hundreds of thousands of dollars that I kind of see going on behind the scenes right now with um, you know law firms. I'm, I'm glad to know that, yeah, I'll say, Kramer and Anderson was not like that. I mean, I actually crossed party lines to keep Attorney DeBella as the town attorney, and it had nothing to do with politics. It had to do with my respect for Attorney DeBella and for Attorney Tower and for the services that they offer. And, and looking but that's the problem with making it political. Right, and looking at the, the numbers of what we have paid, so if we're looking at the 350,000, if you divide that by the, the man hours, you're looking at close to 2,000 man hours. So if we're saying that Kramer and Anderson is doing a very good job and we love the fact that Kramer and Anderson does their work uh, professionally, right, are we gonna be able to look at having one person on staff, 2,000 hours, how is that, how are we going to do that? I don't understand what you're saying. They work full time, 40 hours a week. We're gonna get an attorney working five days a week, 40 hours a week, at least. And I know that she's gonna be working more because she's passionate about her job. What is 40 hours a week times 50 weeks? 2,080 hours. 2,080 hours, okay. So there's your math. That's what we're gonna get. But we're gonna get it all the time, not just, you I mean, you divide it out. I mean, Kramer and Anderson, they do maybe one hour a day, two hours a day, sometimes five hours a day. And that's how it gets divided up over $400,000. We're getting 120 some odd thousand dollars, 2,080 hours every day, just us. And that's the difference. I'll defer for a moment. Mr. Szymanski. So do we have any sort of cost benefit analysis where we look at you know, the existing situation, how it is in the proposed situation where we've said, okay, this is what this is what uh, Ms. Reagan is going to do. This is what outside counsel is going to do to demonstrate that there's a cost savings. Yes, four hundred thousand versus one hundred twenty thousand. No, uh, do we have that analysis? Is what I'm asking it's for, for us to review. Four hundred thousand versus one hundred twenty thousand. That's the analysis. I don't know. So how else do I is, explain that? Okay, so I have some questions then. <laughs> sure. I'm not trying to be. I'm just asking questions, Mike. I'm not. I'm not the not century one. brass work. Is Kramer and Anderson going to take that, keep that, doing that, or is Ms. Rigdon going to do it? We'll discuss, depending on who's comfortable with that. I would imagine that Attorney Tower, uh, which century brass work? You mean the standard litigation? Yeah, the demolition litigation, yeah. The litigation. No, Attorney Tower will continue with that. So at our meeting, what was it, two or three months ago, we were told that the expenses to, maybe it was to date, was 200000 and then we were told it was another 200000 to get it to trial. So if Kramer and Anderson's handling that $200,000, i am i am trying to better understand where the cost savings actually are. Well, I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly what the cost of that litigation is, but let's put it into cost savings. We've engaged in that litigation to get that money back. So that money that we're spending, whether it's 200000 300000 whatever it is, is so that we could get a return of hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there really is no cost if you consider that we expect to be successful in that litigation. If we prevail. If we don't, that's why we that's brought a it. lost cause. Yeah, no, well, that's why we brought it. So, other questions. The municipal tax appeals. Are mm -hmm. we going to handle those in-house or as Kramer and Anderson? I think that's something we could do in-house. Okay. What about all the land use? Is that... Outside or in house? I think land use as well. The whole point is to have in house I'm, counsel just, to address. No, I'm, I'm explaining. I'm, no, I'm, I'm explaining. So, the yeah. land use as well is one of those things that 
there's a lot of back and forth. You know, you're, you're, you're back and forth in you know, the land use offices. It's uh, important to have somebody kind of get back to you. And I think Rebecca is going to provide a lot more responsiveness. Not that Randy or John are not. It's just that um, they have other clients. How about labor negotiations? Labor negotiations are handled right now by our personnel director and our finance director, okay. primarily. Okay. We've taken out legal basically out of uh, those negotiations. Grievance defense, the same thing? That's in there? It's personnel. So could we just ask Ms. Rigdon what her experience is? Sure, no, I was going to invite her up here, you know, okay. to kind of introduce herself. And, okay. But Mr. Wal uh, Mr. Barry had a... Uh, Question. No, let's uh, let's fight and invite the attorney up because I was going to call the question. Okay, Ms. Rigdon, <laughs> Attorney Rigdon, please come on up. Pardon? <laughs> Welcome to the fire. Hi. You sure you still want the job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so here she is. You've got her resume. You've heard me talk. Uh, do you want to say a little bit about yourself to kind of just introduce yourself to the council? I was born and raised in New Milford. I've uh, been here all of my life except for law school when I wound up to Oklahoma City University. I have no idea why, but <laughs> it was a city. But people were very nice and caring, so I did go out there. Um, and then I came back. So I started off in Torrington um, at a small firm there and then started working my way back towards New Milford. I went into Washington Depot. Um, and then I came up on my own. So I've been working in New Milford on my own and since then. Mr. Bay. Still sounds like a win-win situation to me and I'd like to call the question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mr. Szymanski. Uh Just municipal tax appeals. How many have you been involved in where, say, it's, we deal with larger values? So ones that are greater than a million dollar valuation, how many tax appeals have you been involved with? I dealt with quite a few of those in Washington Depot. I couldn't give you a number of okay. uh, guessing, but those, so those were com all commercial or residential? Or? A lot of residential, okay. and it was multi-million dollar. Residential, but, yeah. not commercial. We have a lot of commercial ones, so that's why I'm asking. Sure. Um, land use appeals, how many of those have you been involved with? I did with? a lot of that in Washington as well. So like you zoning, CBA, wetlands. So you would you would represent in in appeals, land use appeals. Right, and unfortunately, when you're an associate, it didn't look like I was doing it because it was in the partner's name. But I did all the back work. He was the face because we all know that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Who was he? Uh, Jim Kelly. Oh. Right. I don't hear any more questions. Uh, we have a motion. We have a second. Oh, all of, oh. Yeah, just I guess there's one real unknown is as it relates to the fees of Kramer and Anderson. Right now, I look back in our December agreement from 15, and they're billing us at $185 an hour. Mm -hmm. If they're going to continue to do the complex litigation aspect, and they're billing a lot of hours, and all I... I I honestly, this was just put on the agenda Friday night. Mm -hmm. So I feel uncomfortable voting on this tonight until I at least get confirmation from Kramer and Anderson that those fees, th those same legal fees are going to be held. If they start charging us, it's nothing against you, just so you know. It's a cost-benefit analysis. It's numbers. You know, it's looking at numbers where if all of a sudden Kramer and Anderson says we're charging three fifty an hour, which is probably the standard rate, well, then maybe the economics of this don't make sense. So I, I just like to ask that. We continue with this one meeting, considering we were just told of it Friday night. Let me just say, we're, we'll negotiate the fees with Kramer or Anderson. I am extremely confident that we'll be able to work out an arrangement. If we don't, then we work out something that does make sense for the town. That's We always have the position with any kind of attorneys. Well, I'd feel much more comfortable if we had a contract in place with attorneys who specialize in complex litigation at an hourly rate we know is locked in. I don't want to be left in a position where we're, we're trying to find attorneys and, and where, how do we know they're going to do it for $185? That, that's peanuts for complex litigation attorneys. Well, they're doing it though. Why are they doing it now? Because they were getting a substantial amount of work from the town, I would imagine. Now they're not. Yeah. 
I'm not as concerned about that. You know, I leave it up to the council. I, I guess, Mayor, all I'm asking no, is no, for no, two me. weeks so we can get this confirmation from them. I think it's important enough to get Attorney Rigdon into the position now so that she can um, get into the job, get acclimated to it, and start addressing some of these really important issues that the town has. That's my recommendation. So, I understand both sides. We'll call I the guess, vote. I'm just asking out of respect for confirmation that the town's money that we have the proper budgetary wherewithal. If we don't know that Kramer and Anderson's gonna hold that rate, how do we know we have the proper amount of money budgeted? It's a fair question, I'm asking for We have a hundred, we're paying that rate now for an up council. Correct. We're gonna have $125,000. That gives us, geez, somewhere in the range of 200 uh, and, and upper thousand dollars to work with. And I'm confident that we're gonna be able to work with Kramer and Anderson and any other law firm that we need to work with to uh, um, manage the litigation that we're currently engaged in. I understand your confidence. I just want confirmation. I understand you want confirmation. Anderson. You're not going to get it tonight. I know. So I understand. I'm so vote against it. That's okay. I understand. Mr. Baird. I'm just asking you to respect my opinion. No, I do respect your opinion, but it's one opinion. I'm putting it to a vote. Mr. Baird? Let me try it again. I'd like to call for a vote. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We have two oppositions, Mr. Banks and Mr. Banks. Uh, welcome to the town attorney position. Oh. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, item H, personnel department. Discussion and possible action on the recommendation of the job description subcommittee to accept the job description of the facilities maintenance lead technician, the facilities Facilities Maintenance Lead Technician description will replace the Facilities Maintenance Supervisor description. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Bolero is here. This did go through the uh, Job Description Committee, right? Yes, it did. Okay, is there a recommendation? Yes, um, Katie and I both sit on that committee and we both reviewed it and we both um, approved the changes and um, I think we're both on board with it, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I couldn't be there, but I did read. Right, yeah. we did. <coughs> we both. And Greg answered the question for me, so I'm happy with that. Okay. Any further comments or discussion? So, does this replace a description or? <coughs> sure, come on up, Greg. Number eight. Oh, here it is. Number eight. Good day. So this replaces. What was the supervisor? This, yeah, this is going to replace the supervisor. So what so was the part of the budget done? changing? What the pay rate for the supervisor was seventy thousand. Yeah. This position is going to be sixty three and change. So it's a change because we're not adding someone. We're going to move. We're going to move the facilities. Um, Second. The lead, not the lead. I'm trying to think of what else position. Senior. The senior. Thank you, Mike. The senior. So the senior is going to move into this lead. It's going to be a savings with down about sixty-seven thousand dollars. How much? I'm sorry. Sixty-seven thousand. Because we're going to we're eliminating Al's old position. We're going to move Dave into this lead position, and that's about a four thousand dollar increase. So with that savings, we've got about a sixty-seven thousand dollar. Six two seven or sixty seven? Sixty seven. Sixty seven. But we just <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong, we just added <coughs> two people in facilities in this budget? We added one person to facilities in this that was a facilities maintenance technician two. So that was the one app, but we also lost out. When Al went to the project manager, we did not fill the supervisor position. So Dave's been working out of class filling essentially the supervisor position. So this is gonna compensate him. A little bit fairly, we're moving around what the responsibilities are. Some of it's going to Mike Zarba, but the others are staying within the department, and Dave's going to be taking kind of the new role for so. But we added a lower employee, right? We <laughs> added a lower employee because of the greater increase in buildings that we've had. Okay. So it's been understaffed for a while. So do we have to update the personnel code to update this pay range and the attorney? This position is actually going to be a uh, union position, so okay. it's staying within the union, and it is covered, so it'll be a grade 13. Uh, the town attorney position is already in the personal code. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Belair. Thank you. All right. Item nine, 
Entertain a motion regarding item A. Discussion and possible action on renewal of the Cons Pond lease for a five-year term with Canterbury School on the same terms and conditions as the lease that expired on June 30th, 2017. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item B. Discussion and possible action on the request to accept a donation of a new stove valued at $175 for the Senior Center. The stove is a donation from the Bouzade Appliances. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Bouzade. Yeah. We, we will be sure to get them out of letter. Item C. Discussion and possible action on the request for Youngsfield Riverwalk Park to be dedicated to the Parks and Recreation Commission. Second. Uh, all in favor? Just, I see Mr. Uh, Calhoun was here before. Dan, do you want to get up just for a second? Kind of uh, answer any questions. Hi, how are you? So, associate, there's, I know there's a, some rain gardens <coughs> associated with that. There's the forest asphalt. There's the maintenance of the planting. So have you been given some sort of maintenance requirements? And um, some basic stuff. I, I, in the walk itself. Yeah, I will still need some training or some information on how to take care of the, the permeable surface. I really never worked on that before, so that's a, it's a learning curve. Fair enough. Ms. Francis. I have a question. Um, now that we've got a different look down there with the trees gone and the stuff. Do you have machines that will go over the edge without going in? We do not. We've been doing, so far this summer, we've been doing it all by hand. Um, we will probably need the assistance of the Public Works Department with their roadside mower to do, yeah, yeah. do the steep and bank. So how have we been doing that? We've been we've been, we haven't gone over the bank, but we're doing as much as we oh. can on the, safely on the surfaces that we can reach. That's just the one thing I was thinking yeah. that we didn't do. So there will be coordination between the two departments? Yes. All right. Any further questions? Dan, it's, it's a great you know, uh, resource. Appreciate it. It came out beautifully. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And we will work together with the various departments. That's okay. Inherent. Thank you. All thank in favor? You. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item D. Discussion and possible action on the acceptance of an anonymous donation of $5,000 as a reward for the arrest and conviction of the person persons responsible for the hate crime at Thompson's Restaurant on August 23rd, 2017. Money to be held in escrow in a separate account to be determined by finance director. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you to this donor. I hope that it leads to positive results. Item 10, Mr. Esposito is not here. He has asked that uh, it be tabled. Uh, I would endorse that suggestion. So uh, let's table item 10. Item 11, oh, I've got tree issues. Okay, let's jump into it. So I don't know if Mr. Um, Emmons is still here. Let me just say, I got in here and I agree. The tree bid and the tree contract is a disaster. That's one of the first things that I realized when I took office, when you had people issuing bids and bidding on projects, $40,000, when they know that they're going to be paid a hundred, 120, $150,000, it's a broken system. So, and Sean Emmons, you know, being awarded the bid has done a tremendous amount of work, not only extra work for the town, but the professionalism that he has shown the record keeping that he has been able to document every single tree and every single tag is, it's like heads and shoulders above what we were doing before. So we've been working to rehabilitate this tree contract and we tried to work with, uh, we invited uh, Carlos to help us and he wouldn't do it. We wanted to just stay with the old tree contract and we knew that it wasn't working. And so we tried to go to the state bid and we tried to integrate uh, other bids from other towns to see what they were doing into the bid that we have now. And we went out to bid, we got three uh, bids on it. One was deemed um, unqualified. And the remaining two, that's not what we were looking in this bid process. We were looking to get away from uh, pointing to one or another. We were looking for competition. And so when we ran out, went out to bid again, and, and now it's down to one, and, and disappointingly, I know uh, Mr. Emmons, you know, basically just said it doesn't need the controversy and the vitriol 
that surrounds this tree situation over the past year and a half. So we just opened that bid last week. I expect that we'll be talking about it, but I agree with the recommendation to go to a, a day rate and to open it up. I don't. Why do we need one tree company? We could have multiple. We've had multiple tree companies in the past. So we're going to work out terms where we hopefully sign up multiple companies and we go to a day rate and um, we address this issue. But it's not easy. It has been a mess. It continues to be a mess. So much so that you know a public works employee had to be fired in the past year because of um, efforts to steer work to one of the tree companies. It wasn't Mr. Emmons. So we've got a lot of problems with our tree situation. We're trying to address it. It's not perfect, but at least we're working towards it. I think we're getting to the point where we've got multiple contractors and a uniform agreement that's, we're gonna to get to the point where this is gonna be not an issue anymore. Yes, Ms. Francis. So my, my reason for bringing it up was, as I said, uh, you were away, but I've received calls and emails from people who are concerned, and, and rightly so, is no one wants a tree to fall on them or their house or their car. And I did come to the bid opening, and all I'm not even going to mention that. I'm just going to mention the prior uh, bid where you said three people responded. Mm -hmm. And so out of those three, none of them were qualified. No, I said one was disqualified. So it was Mr. Emmons and Mr. And, and Gentile's tree company. And that's where we started looking at, you know, why are we just doing this with one company? Why is it one or the other? Can we get to the point where we have some competition and... Um, okay, so you had Gentile and Emmons. Right. And then fast forward to last week, mm -hmm. you opened up one from Gentile. Right. So Sean is not, as you said to me, he's not bidding this, but perhaps if we go back to the two vendor mm -hmm. system that seemed to work, for everybody that stood up here that knows what's going on, um, are you amenable to that? Are you open to that? I think that's a good idea. With yeah, absolutely. Gentile and Emmons? Well, we'll consider both of them, absolutely. Because they've worked together before and it worked well. Sure. And I, I think, you know, for me... I agree, yeah. It's, a, it's public health and safety, which is the A number one thing that we as a body should be concerned about. And I don't want to find out the hard way that someone does have damage or injury yeah. that we're here going on and on and on about this since January, I would really like to just ask that you please sit down with Sean or whatever it might take and Mr. Gentile and let's just get a contract going. Well, let me be clear. The trees are being addressed. I mean, if there's, if there's a tree that poses an imminent threat to, to the health or welfare of any person, that tree comes down. We're not dickering about it. But who are you asking to do it if none of these people want Mr. to? Mr. Emmons is still is still our guy. Okay, Sean, you still our guy? I, the last list that Carlos was talking about, the town asked me to take down those trees. Mm -hmm. I, I took down those trees. The meeting of the day of the meeting, half that list was done the following day. The rest of the list was so done. all the trees that need to come down are down? Everything that was on my list is done. Right. But that does that mean Carlos is? I'm going to just ask him because we, he's the expert. Is are we still living with trees that need to come down because they're not safe? Don't approach the council. Yes, well, that's up to the mayor. But I just no, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Oh, that's that's up to us. Let's yeah. invite Mr. Carrot out up. This is yeah. a contractor that works for the town. Yeah. I, I would appreciate if you already mentioned my name. And, and said some things that are flatly false. Right? So I would really appreciate oh, yeah. the opportunity to, to give Please come up, because I would love to address some of the things that you've said as well, which are politicized and frankly have destroyed the reputation of our town in the entire region. Nobody wants to bid on these contracts Mr. because Mayor, you politicized you, it. You have it's disgusting. the facts beyond belief. Disgusting. You are trying to grind a personal vendetta axe that you have with Sam Gentile. You can Mr. see Emmons the results. It's tremendous. Don't interrupt me. You can oh, see. No, I will. The, don't interrupt me. Mr. Emmons has done a tremendous Mr. job. Mr. Emmons does you fabulous work. You don't get he to. Does you don't get to work. talk so about my Gentile. motivation. We are recessing the council for five minutes. You want to work for the town. The council is recessed for five minutes. Yeah. This is how you want to work for the town, right? Keep yelling. Recess. 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 Recess
five okay. minutes. Thank you. You just proved my point. Yeah. No, recess you know for five minutes. minutes. Yeah. You know what you're doing. Five, five minute recess. You're scumbag. Good. You can't yeah, wait. Yeah, I want to appoint it to you. No, you, know you right. Are. I want to know what. Yeah. You want to see work with you. Gentlemen, you can leave. No. You can actually leave the company. I'm not leaving. If you're going to keep the Go ahead, get the police to escort me out. I'm not leaving. You can sit here, but you do have to be really quiet unless you're invited up to speak. Okay, yeah, sure. Good. Well, if not, I'm going to call the police. Call them. Yeah, record me, Mr. Mullen. Go ahead. Yeah. Great. Thumbs up. You see the corrupt mayor you got? Now you know why nobody wants to work for the town? How many times do I have to fit? You know what? There may be a lawsuit coming.
Oh, do you? I feel sorry for you. No, I'm just teasing. I'm kidding. No, he, he, was, he really helped me out with a couple of trees. So. Did uh, Leah leave? Yeah, she has to get up at 5 in the morning or something. How are you doing? I'm so sorry I missed your due. I know, but you were away, and then yeah. are you feeling better? Yes, thank goodness. It's amazing what drugs will do. <laughs> it's amazing what medication will do. It'll perk you right up. I'm waiting to cramp. I, it was I just texted mine. It was a full design. I wanted to get a picture. I didn't let him in. same situation that we were in uh, over the course of earlier in the year where we went as long as four or five months with tagged dangerous trees standing waiting for action. We haven't had that amount of time elapse, but yes, the answer to your question in short is yes. Approximately how many would you say? Right now? Yeah. I don't know. It's not. It's a handful. Yeah. And, it's, and we're talking about at this point uh, coming approaching a month. <clears throat> So then I would just say then, so that can be handled through whatever system you've been using without a contract, using Sean or whatever, you could make sure that that's taken care of. Because these are people who live here who've asked about this, and it's, I, it's not I, in front I, of my house, but... No, I mean, Mr. Frank, let me, let me say this as well. Of course, I mean, this goes through, I'm not in my office, you know, picking off trees, what tree comes down and what tree comes down. I haven't communicated or spoken by email with Mr. Caridad since February. So this is the first that I'm hearing of any issue regarding trees. It goes through a public works department. 
they were instructed to take down the trees that they can take down and what they can't gets tagged and gets uh, put on a list and that list gets handed to Mr. Emmons and this is the first I'm hearing that it's not being complied with. But of course, if there's an issue, if there's a tree, we're going to address it. But the bigger issue is the contracts. We want to get it done and we want to get the best contract and the best kind of competition um, possible. And that's it. So in, in January, the mayor is correct, I have not corresponded directly with him since February. And that is because all of the correspondence and communication that I had with him went ignored. I met with him several times uh, up until November. I realized I was getting lip service. I decided emails was the right way to memorialize exactly what was going on and the liability that was the, the town was being exposed to. Um, January, Mr. Mayor, I have grave concerns over the current dysfunction of our tree program. Based on our discussion of November X, I was left with the impression, yada, yada, continue to ignore these trees exposes the town to serious liability. As it stands, the town is not in conformance with state statute. February, Mr. Mayor, to allow trees identified, um, hazard trees to identify to languish on a list is simply kicking the can down the road and leaves the town completely exposed. The tree contract needs to be offered for bids and awarded without further delay. This is February, okay? The bids were just, we got bids in, in July, okay, July. Sam Gentile came out to be low bidder. He did the same thing he did when he took office. He, did, he has a personal issue. I don't know what it is, and I would ask you, Mr. Mayor, whatever it is, if there is a reason that Sam Gentile cannot work for this town, you need to say it out here. If it's factually based, put it out there on the table. I ask you right now. I'll do, this, I'll do one better for you. Even despite his outburst and calling me a scumbag and all these things, and his, fed up. His, his, excuse me, let, please, Mr. Mr. Carradine. We're trying to de-escalate de this. I understand your passion, but just relax. Let's de-escalate. Let me say this. Despite calling me a scumbag, and despite the reaction after the award at the last, what was it, a year and a half ago, the reaction from not only him and his wife and, and uh, yelling at my staff and yelling at people, I don't hold that against them. I don't. Hold that that Sir, against the chair them. has asked you to be quiet. If you can't be quiet, Sir, I'm going to ask you to leave here. the meeting. Sir, just, just listen. I don't hold that because this isn't personal for me. I don't care about being offended. You can say whatever you want about my motivations. The only motivation I care about is getting the best tree work for the town's dollar. So I will consider Mr. Gentile. I'll consider Mr. Emmons if he's willing. Um, I'd just consider why Mr. Did we Quaranta. Re why, why did we rebid in July? Why did you not accept? His bid, because it was made in good faith, and you decided to rewrite the contract in a way that I got calls from people saying, "What is this document you put out there? Nobody wants to bid on this. It's crazy." Competition. Two bids was not competition. We want the best but deal for the town. Nobody wants to bid. I tried. I called other contractors. Why are you, 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 you getting up at me? Like it's my fault. Because I asked you, you politicized <laughs> this. You have you're the made one it. writing letters. Excuse me. You're writing letters in the newspaper. You're on Facebook making all kinds of claims. No, wrong, you're coming wrong, to town wrong. council I'm meetings writing letters to instead the of talking to me. When you say you tried to talk to me, I'm not involved in the tree business. I'm not. It goes through public works and then it gets yourself. to me. I don't sit there and kind of approve lists or anything like that, but what I did get involved is when 70% of the tree budget was blown through in a weekend. That's where I got involved. And, and that employee and no longer works for us. And you where fired were somebody. You? And you fired so. Where were like you that. in supervising that? These, and that's I where I got supervise, involved. I don't supervise public works people. That is you not are. my role. This is the problem when I, that I identified back then. You're the tree warden. You're the only person that has authority to tag a tree. You're supposed to put notice on it, give people 10 days before it takes it down, Wrong. and then it comes down. Wrong. And the way it's been done is that public works has Read been Read the statute. If you're going to quote the statute, I've know the right statute. Here. Okay? It, uh, when the tree warden determines that there is a hazard right involved, here. there's no posting requirement. I always right. post trees in road widenings, bridge jobs where it's appropriate. So you're, you're quoting something completely so you, out of context. You have no knowledge of it. But those are the trees. When they don't pose a hazard... Those are the trees. I don't post trees that have no hazard and not post them. And you've got to do do it your do your board. homework later. Let's discuss at what's at hand. Hold on a second. If the public you, safety demands the removal or pruning of any tree under the tree warden's control. The tree warden may cause such trunk or tree to be removed at the expense of the town, um, and shall be and shall order paid to the person performing such work such reasonable compensation 
as, as shall be approved, and approved in, writing in writing by the tree, tree warden. warden. Exactly. So, so you have not engaged you. me at all. I have been after you to get a contract out there. You went ahead and had your finance director try to twist arms of, of contractors to get them to bid on a contract that was extremely poorly written without any input from Mike Zarba or myself. No, Mike, Mike contributed to that contract. He absolutely contributed language. Let me tell you something. Out. Mike and I have had a lot of conversations about the, the unbelievable poor quality of that document. He helped and the it. fact that you, no, you <laughs> wouldn't, we just talked about it today. You wouldn't send to him a red line document as you would not send to me. Let's, that let's tracked any going. changes, so we were left in the dark. Let's keep going. Unless the condition of such tree or shrub, a shrub constitute an immediate public hazard, the tree warden shall, at least 10 days before such removal, post thereon a suitable notice stating the tree warden's intention to remove such tree. You that's not it. being done. You read it correctly. That's, where, that's not being done. I know it that's not being done. It absolutely is being done. I'm sorry. There, 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 there is, this is, is no <laughs> on the table. M Mr. Mayor, let me let me tell you. I'm going to close. I'm going to close my remarks. I'm going to close my remarks. I'm not a political animal. Okay. I made the mistake. I made the mistake of voting for you. I'm, the biggest mistake I ever made in politically was voting for you. Good. I'm not here for your vote. I'm not here to buy your votes. I'm here to earn votes. You're not here to respect the rule of law. And I'm not going to buy it by giving it to Genteel or anybody else. You're not here to respect transparency. It's your agenda and nobody else's. I am leaving, and and you know what else? You're not here. only are you looking, well, like right now, not only are you looking sir. for new tree <laughs> contractors, <laughs> you're looking for a new tree warden. Okay. Very well. I, we're actually already have public works training for it. My sir. twenty years of service to this program, to this program, are over. Your resignation is, is accepted. The underhanded way you've been running. Thank you. Thank you. Not nice. political, right? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> All right. What's next on the uh, interesting agenda? Oh, Mr. Szymanski, let's, let's pile on. What else? What? What did you say? No, no, let's pile on to this issue. What else do you want to pile on to? Are we still on the tree issue? No. Okay. I guess my point is, I don't understand your comment first. We've resolved nothing. We have people here yelling. We have resolved something. The mayor is going to be working on a new um, who, contract. So, so who wrote the contract that we just got one bidder on? So I can better understand. It was a conglomeration with Public Works, the Finance Department, and the purchasing uh, the other people in the Finance Department. So here's as well as working with some other towns in their contracts. So here's my concern. I reviewed it as a layman. I looked at Sean's comment about stump grinding. It's totally valid. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, he's saying stump grinding is on an hourly basis. So that means I could go rent a stump grinder from Taylor's and give you an hourly rate of $10 an hour and take 30 hours to do a stump. And Sean could come in with his big machine and do it in 10 minutes. We're not Here's, using the contract. I agree. It's not perfect. And I'm not perfect. But it was I, just changed to, that change was just made to the contract before it was by itch. Well, before I tried to engage with Mr. Caridad and engage him in rewriting this contract and coming up with a different way of bidding this process out, and I was met with <laughs> obstacles at every turn. So well, this is the best that we came up with. Is it perfect? Clearly not, because we didn't get a lot of bids for it, but we're trying. But our person who's our current tree vendor said this bid document's horrible. To okay. me, that, that's upsetting. To me, it's upsetting that to after, me after the document's been modified, and I don't know who modified it, but whatever. It's been modified to a point where a current tree vendor says it's horrible. So I think the I want to I want to solve this. I don't, I, I, and it's no disrespect to you. I don't think it's solved by you or the finance director rewriting the bid package. I think we need to get people who are professionals in this, or I just agree. go to the state bid. Well, so how can the we tree move this forward? Is a professional and was unwilling to work with me. I just saw Joe Coronta outside and. Uh, I expect to try to write a bid with him, but I think what we're coming up with and talking with Mr. Edmonds and the reasons why he didn't bid on this package, going back to a situation where we have multiple people awarded the contract work um, for a uniform package, going to the day rate, I think the day rate is a great idea. But, so we'll but in, work towards in our, doing in that. Our bids, this is the bid specs they just bid on. The, the Why are you rate? going backwards? I'm telling you, you asked me what I want to do, and I'm going to the day rate. Like Mr. Because Hammond's I just feel like we've lost six months for no reason. <laughs> Why? We're still working. 
So may I ask Mr. Emmons, how much? So M Mr. Emmons just presented to us that we're wasting our money by continuing to use it. So we're taking this laissez-faire attitude about how we're going to fix it. Laissez-faire? I'm the only one who's ever tried to actually revise the bid in, whatever, 15, 20 years. I'm we, trying to fix this. now we're to a point where one person's bidding. This okay. Is not, this is not working. Oh, so I thank you for pointing that out. That's what I'm so, saying. We're going to another... So how much longer is my question as a town council? How much longer <laughs> are we, in essence, going to pay double for our tree work? What, are we acting on our current bid? Are we, what are we doing? We're so we acting have on our action. current bid. And when will we have a decision on that, an award on that? No, the current okay. bid, which has currently been awarded to Mr. Emmons. That That's expired, the bid that we're that still... expired nine months ago, didn't it? Well, it's been extended. So He's well. still agreeing to perform work under that bid. So may I ask Mr. Emmons, how much longer are you going to work under that bid? In an infinity? I mean, you've just told us you're basically, in essence, overcharging the town. I mean, if the, the bid needs to go out, it needs to go out by the day. And it's proven in the documents that I gave you. I understand Mr. Zarva's concern about going by the day. I think you guys need to sit down with him and talk to him. Uh, as far as problematic trees, I have no problem taking care of them and get this thing resolved. But it needs to happen quickly. I have a schedule to take care of, and I'm not pushing my customers off anymore. So I want to get resolved, I want to get going, get done with. So what's quickly mean in your mind, so we're clear? Is that a month, three months, a year? It needs to get done quickly, like in the next month. Thank you. We'll have this resolved in the next one to two weeks. Thank you. Great. Fair. Okay. Item 12. Okay. Um, motion to approve the appointment to the Inland West Wetland Center Commission to review the appointment of the Inland Wetlands Commission. Um, John Learson, unaffiliated. Mr. Learson will fill the vacant alternate position for a term in 9-11-2017 to 11-30-2018. There a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Motion to approve the appointment um, to the Economic Development Commission of Lancy Utoba. Utoba. Second. Democrat Second. for 9-11-2017 to 11-30-2021. She will fill the expired position of Mr. Kilberg. There's a second. Second. Yes, okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Motion to approve the appointment to the Pension Committee. Jeffrey Winter, Democrat. Um, he will fill the position vacated by Mr. Silve for the term 9 11 2017 to 11 30 2017. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. A uh, motion to the, uh, approve the appointment to the Sewer Commission of Alexander J. Karp, Democrat. Um, he'll fill the position, position vacated by Mr. Chamberlain's resignation. The term 9-11-2017 to 11-30-2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Motion to approve uh, appointment of, to the Planning Commission and the Milford Aqua Protection Agency of Julie Learson, Democrat. She will fill the position vacated by um, John Kane's resignation for the period of 9 11 2017 to 11 30 2017. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 13. Um, motion for um, approval to, um, for the request for closure of Bank Street on Saturday, October 7, 2017, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. for October Second. Fest. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Motion to approve the request by the Park and Recreation Department to close the southbound travel lane of Main Street to through traffic from the top of the green south to Bridge Street, including Bang Street, and the two crossovers on Tuesday, October 31st, 2017, between the hours of 5.15 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. for the Halloween trick-or-treat event. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Motion to approve the request by Harrybrook Park to close Lanesville Road from the firehouse to the entrance of Harrybrook Park on Saturday, November 25th, 2017, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. for this Run Santa run. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 14. Uh, motion for discussion and possible action authorizing Mayor Gronbeck to sign an agreement with state 
for Myra Levasur and Leo Gio to become certified Access Health Connecticut application counselors. The Town Senior Center will be certified site for New Milford consumers offering assistance to clients who are not yet eligible for Medicare. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Leo, I know you're here. If you want to just explain a little bit about it. Uh... Sure, sure. Uh, so Access Health is for health insurance for those who are 60 and not yet on Medicare. Medicare comes into effect when you're 65 unless you're disabled. Um, so in order to get those individuals insurance, we have to go on the portal of Access Health and we have to enter in all this certain information and make sure that we're doing it correctly so that they're given the proper premium tax credits that reduce their premiums for the year. Um, so in essence, we already do this, um, but by taking the training, we'll be certified and uh, all the better, right? Yeah. Very good. Great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right, good luck. Thank you. Item 16. Uh, motion for discussion and possible action on the request to accept a donation of $2,500 from the Farmer's Table, a program of Partners for Sustainable Healthy Communities, Incorporated. This donation will be used for two internships, one high school student and one college student, so that they may participate in the Youth Agency Sullivan Farm Project. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Motion uh, for discussion and possible action regarding September 2017 refunds in the amount of $8,247.61, leaving a balance of $47,017.91 um, in the refund account. Okay, there's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 17. Motion to um, accept and adopt the revisions to the New Milford Code of Ordinance. C 6C-5, 22-23, 24-1, and 18-72, as presented at the public hearing held August 14, 2017. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Bass? Motion carries. Item 18. Maybe we take it. Do you guys need a little break before this to set up? Uh, maybe a couple, about two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. How about a two minute recess? Thank you, everybody. doing? Ready? Before you get started, let's just do a little house, housekeeping. There was a uh, number that was wrong. Entertain a motion uh, regarding item 16, tax collector. Um, I just want to amend the motion to read that the balance um, will be $38,770.30 and not the $47,791. So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carries. Thank you. Gentlemen, Green Cap, welcome back to your phase one presentation. Great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Doug Esposito. It's my partner, John, with Green Cap Advisors. Advisor. We're basically Green Water, uh, not too far down the road. Uh, for those of you here a couple months ago, we were tasked to do an assessment of the community center from an energy perspective, and that's what we'd like to present this evening. The members of the town council actually have a four or five, maybe six page uh, PDF file. It's a little bit more comprehensive than what you're going to see up on the screen. What we've got from the presentation is just kind of a bullet point highlight, um, just to get the dialogue going, and recognize that we need to have a discussion. Um, so, with that, John. Just a quick review of uh, what we'll do tonight. Uh, look, we'll talk about what our tasking was, where's the building now, where does it need to be, highlights of what our recommendations will be, and then, of course, we can talk about the benefits and what the next steps will be. And the biggest part of it, about the questions. Uh, this is a big uh, project in that there's a lot of moving parts. And so we try to boil this down and pair it back and keep it simple, not because they're not the issues aren't worth talking about, it's just there's a lot. So we thought we'd approach it from a summary perspective and let everybody dig in um, as we move forward and new information becomes available. Uh, the first thing we did is um, we, we hired uh, Sparhawk Engineering, they're an engineering firm based up in Maine that we worked with in the past. Um, and they did the bulk of the heavy lifting when it came to figuring out the engineering part of this. Um, so they came in, looked at our physical systems, mechanical systems, and the building insulation, looked at everything. Uh, then they went through their process and their procedure to determine what the building is currently uh, from an energy consumption and what it needs to be. Uh, we worked with them to put a plan in place. Uh, once we had that, John and I were able to start putting some capital costs associated to it. And then once you have that, then you can make some theoretical uh, arguments about what a return on investment would be and 
how you might structure a transaction. So that's what we're here to present tonight. This piece right here, uh, Petty Bones energy use is 68% higher than the average school in the database. So where this comes from, members of the town council have in their packets a little bit more um, more of an explanation there. It talks about energy use intensity. So with the spar up or the engineering what they do is they basically look at the building, it's designed, uh, the materials, the heating and cooling systems and electrical systems and all that, and then they compare that to a database in the system. And what they concluded was based on Pettibone's structure, its energy use was 68% higher than the average school in the database nationwide. Um, that's good, leave it right there. Um, let's go back again. So it's currently, or not currently, but its last primary use had been a school use for three seasons. Obviously, they, it's no secret to the HVA systems are antiquated and efficient. There's no air sealing, and obviously the lighting can be upgraded. So that's in a nutshell where it is right now. So that 68% is kind of the, the crux of what drives the rest of the assessment. So that's why we highlighted that fact. So where we need it to be is an office use building. Uh, and just I'll say it now is that when you go through this process with an engineering firm, what they, they're very quick to point out is that um, when you transition from a school use to an office use, the electric consumption goes up. So even if you use the same three seasons, your electric consumption would be higher, your energy consumption would be higher. Uh, and obviously we're gonna convert it to a four season building. Um, and add cooling. And add cooling, right? So, uh, let's see, energy consumption. Okay, so uh, this should be one more bullet point. Yeah, there it is. So energy consumption is a three season school. Uh, that's based on historical data that we, was provided to us from the town. We forwarded that to Sparhawk, and that was about $115,000 a year. It was split roughly 50-50 between gas and electric. I think it was 55,000 gas and maybe 60,000 in electric. When you extrapolate that 68% higher use that we talked about earlier the school, and you turn it from a three season to a four season, and from a school use to an office use, that 115 becomes $205,000 a year. So taking what's there right now, if you were to, I should point out that that 205,000 includes incorporating window air conditioning units. And I'll talk a little bit about the different scenarios that we model, but um, that's, that's how we get to that. You're going from school use three season to four season office with uh, window unit upgrades throughout the school. Go ahead. So and this is the highlight right here. In short, the, the, there was a high utility bill coming town's way, one way or another. Huh. What we did uh, in our analysis, and again, the members of the town council have a little bit more of an explanation, is we created two scenarios. Um, the second one being our recommendation <coughs> of upgrades. The first scenario being um, the existing systems, no insulation, no lighting upgrades, um, and then retrofitting about 200 window air conditioning units, 8 to 12,000 BTUs. <coughs> Uh, and that's how we got to that $205,000 electric uh, cost or utility cost of, uh, for a four season office building. So we compared those two scenarios and we ran out a bunch of cash flows and I could go through a long list of um, uh, assumptions that were made as part of that. But when you run it out over 20 years, you, you discover that somewhere between $900,000 and $1.2 million over 20 years is saved, again, relative to the higher cost utility. This isn't off the 115, it's off the 205,000 number. So by doing the upgrades, uh, knowing that you would have spent 205,000, by doing the upgrades you save anywhere from 900 to a million, or to 1.2 million dollars. So, and obviously we haven't delved in further, we haven't done specific design engineering. Um, we looked at ongoing maintenance costs of existing systems just as a back of the napkin. We didn't. Uh, delve into great detail on that. We have some sense of about $15,000 a year to maintain the current HVA system, uh, heating system, uh, things like that. We didn't value uh, leasing any space because obviously you can't lease the space now because it's not desirable space, but if you do these upgrades, you can in theory lease that space so there might be some income uh, that you might be able to incorporate into the analysis. We didn't include that. Uh, and obviously we don't know the cost of capital. We don't know if it's a 4% loan, 5%, 6%, we just don't know where that's at right now. So we modeled it somewhere in the middle, but obviously that's the reason you get the wide spread over time. Uh, the other thing we did, and again, it's not addressed in this summary here, is that in both scenarios, we incorporated a new roof. Okay, so that's, that's equal. 
Um, it worked out, we had a, a couple of contractors come in and that worked out to be in the million dollar range. Anywhere from 950 to 1.2 million were the estimates we got as part of that. So having been up on the roof ourselves and seeing the condition of the roof, I'm not a roofer, but my sense is that the roof needs to be replaced. And that's what we were told. So that's a, that's a given in both scenarios. And we have numbers that sort of suggest um, or incorporate those numbers. So, so we're going to start with how the story might end if we decide to move forward with this. Um, we incorporated, uh, well, John, I'll let you talk about this. This is a little bit more. Um, I guess to start with, uh, when you look at a building, you obviously look at the building envelope. And uh, right now, the building, uh, you know, its current design, skylights, uh, uh, you know, there's certain sections of the building uh, that, um, uh, uh, that are so old that there's a little bit of separation. So we can air seal or, you know, foam seal those air. So the first thing you're going to look at is you're going to um, air seal and foam seal the, the whole building perimeter and make the building tight. Uh, as you can see in the, the diagram up there, we have uh, solar panels. We would eliminate a lot of uh, skylights, which again are, are, are heat sucks, um, and a lot of the side lights uh, that are also are heat sucks. And just um, right now, the, the classroom's got a lot of light anyway. Um, we were gonna put in better LED soft lighting. Um, yet our intention is to you know, almost cut the lighting cost by 50%. The, uh, the solar, um, uh, production that we're anticipating for the building will create approximately about 65% of the um, electrical uh, demand for the year. Um, we also have, uh, we're going to be putting in uh, M-Trident systems, uh, which would uh, create about 24-25% of the electrical demand. Overall, we'll make about 90, uh, you know, 88 to 90% of the, the total building's electrical demand. Uh, what we also had planned to do, uh, well, I'll, I'll save that part for last. Uh, for heating and cooling is we were looking at putting in um, ultra energy efficient uh, next air or EMR units. Uh, they're gas heat pump systems. So they're, um, they're kind of a little bit similar to a uh, mini split system, um, but uh, they would be you know, like times three. Uh, these are designed for large, large buildings. Um, as you'll see in the flyover, uh, the benefit of, of these putting in these units is that um, there's going to be at least uh, construction disruption to you know the, uh, the building occupants. Um, the units uh, that are installed um, are they're basically either going to be ceiling cassettes, wall cassettes, or window cassettes. Something that would be similar that you would see like in a motel. Um, except ours are 99% efficient and the motel room units are not. Um, the other, um, in the uh, front section of the building where it says resilient area, we have contemplated making that uh, resilient to so the emergency shelter where uh, we would have a battery backup UPS system. Uh, so the, uh, basically the cafeteria, auditorium, and library uh, would be 110% uh, of their energy requirement. The rest of the building, uh, you, we'd be able to supply um, heating, cooling, and common area lighting. Uh, the office area plug load, I'm not sure yet. You know, that'll be determined later. But so you're, uh, uh, and I guess we can do the, the line. Sure. Now, again, just uh, we were discussing this earlier. Can you explain to everybody what the tri-gen units are? We will. We can just do the video. Can I, can I, can I just I'm sorry. Fit the, you're actually not supposed to take comments from um, the members of the public at this point. Okay. I'm sure he would love to ask you that question after the meeting. Sure.
week just to give you some sense of what the system would look like on the building. Uh, what you're seeing there are the trigen units, the York units, and the gas heat pumps, and obviously the solar panels. So just wanted to give you some sense of what that looks like. Um, so uh, obviously, as I said earlier, there's a lot of moving parts on a project like this. And, and while we've taken it as far as we can, um, obviously there's still more work to do, more analysis to be done. But based on what we've discovered so far, um, these are some of the advantages we see of moving forward with the project. Um, about $55,000 a year natural gas consumption in its school use. That natural gas consumption would go down about $25,000 a year. So that's based on the $0.89 cents per CCF that the town is paying. Um, that goes from $55,000 down to $25,000 based on our analysis. Obviously, we got a four-season building out of it. Um, talk about you know, the basic structure of the building. It's in pretty good shape. What are your alternatives? If you didn't use this building, what would you use? It seems to be a pretty good building um, in terms of <coughs> bones, as they say. Um, we've already partnered up with uh, UConn and their Center for Clean Energy Research. Um, East, uh, was it? Eastern Connecticut. Eastern Connecticut and uh, UMass uh, Center for Center um, and Henry Abbott Tech, all that expressed interest in, in being a part of this project is in a collaborative sort of way from an educational perspective. Um, as I uh, wrote up there earlier, we talked about 900,000 to 1.2 million. Not that you can equate these two numbers, but if the roof is about a million dollars and you save 900 to 1.2 million, in theory, you, you pay for your roof. I, I, you know, those are just coincidentally about the same amount, so that's one way to look at it. Uh, we've got the resiliency that John talked about in the gymnasium and the library area. And then, of course, if you're able to lease out space, um, that's obviously a source of income that we previously didn't have. And so that would have to be a part of the analysis going forward. Uh, so what the project accomplishes is that um, uh, we're going to reduce the um, electric and the heating cooling load significantly, or at least the projected cooling load uh, dramatically. Um, you're also going to have lower maintenance costs. Uh, uh, by having LED light bulbs, you're not going to have to replace, you know, two or three hundred or you know light bulbs a year, uh, which are expensive. Then you've got recycling costs, you've got man hours, etc. Um, yeah. So you're, um, and it's actually expensive. I had to. Re um, one of my buildings I put in, um, we put in all of the light bulbs. I had 400 light bulbs and I couldn't put them in the dumpster. You have to recycle them. It was $400. Uh, it was 200 bulbs, I guess. It was $400 to, re you know, to recycle those bulbs. So it, it is, it gets uh, very uh, costly. Um, uh, energy stewardship, uh, we talked to uh, Connecticut D, the Green Bank. Everybody is excited about this potential project. Um, uh, the Green Bank is working with us to develop a municipal finance program, you know, so that they can do more projects like this. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to repeat about the care ceiling and insulation. None exists. Um, so we're hoping to save about 8 to 10 percent uh, on the cost, uh, you know, heating and cooling uh, by, by insulating and air sitting in space. Um, we will utilize and maximize the uh, utility rebate programs. Um, on the Trigon systems, we are eligible to get a, a special DG gas rate, so about a third of the heating cooling for the system. Instead of paying 89 cents, uh, we'd probably be in the 60 to 65 cent range. So it's, it would be cheaper to operate that system for both heating and cooling. Um, as stated earlier, um, part of the building uh, is, you know, Herman and Harvey, uh, there in the event of a storm, uh, this could be another, I know you have Sarah Noble, this could be the, the second um, you know, centrally located uh, shelter, uh, auditorium, cafeteria, library area, potentially could be used for that. Um, and as Doug stated earlier, you need a new, new roof. Uh, the zone HVAC, uh, I mean, talking to uh, teachers, uh, the maintenance personnel, um, you know, everybody complained in the past it was either 90 degrees or 60 degrees. You know, people were either freezing or they were, or if they were at the end of the line, you know, or, or vice versa, they were, uh, they were sweating. It was too hot or too cold. Um, our systems will have, uh, um, are going to be designed for comfort for the occupants. Uh, it's going to be zoned systems for every room will be zoned. Um, and it's going to be 
tremendously more efficient, and it, and with a tighter building, the occupants are going to uh, are going to feel better. So, uh, overall, we're anticipating about an 80 percent uh, energy savings over uh, you know the projection and significant uh, significant that came in the top. Sorry. Um, significant uh, deferred maintenance cost. Uh, last year, we were told uh, the town spent about twenty-five thousand uh, dollars just nursing the boiler along, the and then then you add in all the light costs, you know, the light replacement costs, etc. It, it all adds, everything adds up to big numbers. And next step, uh, why don't we table that for right now? Why don't we okay. open the back to the Council members, see if you have any questions. I have one. I have a question. Sure, um, so the resilient area, what's the add-on cost for turning that section of the building into what you call a resilient area? It's about a hundred and about hundred and fifty thousand for the uh, for the battery cost. Because the solar we've already factored right. in. Right, okay. So to add what a battery. What about the ceiling? You said something about ceiling around that wasn't on the oh, the, the, the air air ceiling insulation that's okay. that's about fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so a couple hundred thousand, would you say? Yeah. So the, the air ceiling insulation we would do first. Yeah. Uh, that would be an absolute because that's a you know what they call a low hanging fruit. Right. No, I just because we do have another emergency shelter at Sarah Noble. Is that a a, a definite needed expense? To well, one of the other thoughts on the on the battery for the resiliency, and not to oversell it, but um, because you've got the battery system, you can peak shape. So you can, if the system is designed with that in mind, you can actually avoid paying the demand rate for electric. So basically, run off the battery during the hot August day. Yeah, no, I understand, yeah. but making it, a, if you just took that away and just made it like the rest of the building, that's my question. So I want to know how much more it was costing us if we went with that resilient area. Right. Which is a duplication of something we already have. Right, no, no, I, I understand yeah. that. I'm just so saying that. That would that, be that, about $150,000? Correct, but okay. I'm just adding the fact that that battery right. also serves another purpose where it could be used operating. Without, costs. but so that's the battery is one component out of everything. Right. So you Absolutely. can still do everything, the battery is going to be there. I'm just asking what would come out if you didn't make it resilient. So it's about right. $150,000. Right. Okay, thanks. Mr. Metz. Well, a few questions. Uh, first, uh, I noticed in your your packet, which you did stay in your uh, your deck, that uh, the particular uh, project pay, uh, pay going is sixty eight percent higher in average costs for for uh, electric. Uh, no, that was overall overall use overall energy use. And why why is that? Um, you have extremely antiquated you know, uh, old systems. Uh, that uh, your systems now either they run or they don't. They're uh, to you know heat the entire building and it has to go on a whole loop and then come back. And generally, by the time it it, you know, it gets to the end, um, the, the people at the front of the building are are, are dying. You know, they're they're super hot. Um, they're you know back in uh, I think it was 1955 when it was built. They weren't really concerned with. Uh, insulating or you know uh, windows. Um, uh, you, I mean, the good news is you did have. I'm not sure. You know, probably five or ten years ago, you did put in T8 light bulbs. Um, now there's uh, there's big incentives to put in the LEDs, which will last 15 years. So you won't have to replace them. I I, I probably had about you know in one of my buildings like seven or eight hundred dollars cost. So mine, you know, is what. You know, eight thousand square feet. Think of it. You have sixty-nine thousand square feet. How I many? It, it's it's a big number. Um, and in your assessment of looking at the uh, HVAC equipment, so you talked about two antiquated uh, Smith boilers. What do you anticipate the life use of those boilers? I I'm not a mechanical engineer. I mean, they're my um, engineer looked at it. We walked through with them, and he goes, he said, you know, well, those uh, pneumatic controls are all antiquated. They don't work. They you know, you have to spend thousands to replace it. I mean, it's, so basically, your options are you can band-aid a bad system, or you can put brand new systems, you can put forever systems, or you can spend a lot of money every year and band-aid a system and get it to last as long as you can. If you rip out the boilers and put new boilers in, 
you're not really solving the problem. You're still on a big loop, right. you know, and and the people are still going to be either super hot or super cold. Uh, next question I had is you talked about the 2,500 2, BTU window air conditioning units that would be in the in the I'll, building. Uh, the the, BT, the window units. Uh, the, the, the BT units, the, uh, the 12,500 BTU. That's what the engineer recommended that we would need. Right. And do you put that in the deck, cost savings versus efficiencies? Well, well, what I guess what we were told is the options were if, uh, if you didn't put in a new HVAC system, you're basically, you can't have people, well, I guess you could, but it wouldn't be very kind to them, is you would have no HVAC. The, 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 the simplest thing is you put in window units, but then there's a big cost to that because it's not, you've got to have a, a carpenter come in and he's got to you know, basically either take out the window, reframe it, put the window in. There's a significant cost for every window. Right. It's probably a thousand dollars a window. And when you, were, when you were doing your analysis of these window units, what is the time life of a air conditioner in a window unit? I, I don't know, sir. Uh, because that would be years, that would be a five years, seven years. Right. So if we're taking five years, that'd be an additional cost in five years of refitting another two hundred window air conditioning units. Correct. Yeah. No, we did, we did not include that cost in five or seven years. We did not add that cost in again. So in theory, the, the savings would be even higher by going with the upgrade. I'll I'll defer for a moment. Thank you. Sister Mesky. Uh. We only got this on Friday night, so I had a lot of time to look at it. I hope we can continue the discussion on this. So I just have some questions. So when we're looking at the baseline of the electric usage as a three-season building today, I guess we're calling it, of 115,000, you're saying that in your analysis, we're making the, the assumption to not only is it occupied a couple more months out of the year, because it, it was occupied in the summer months, for Board of Ed from an electric usage perspective. They have programs, their youth agency had programs there and stuff. So, so the building was still used in the summer. So how did you calculate the increase? You know, I'd like to see some of the backups so we can review it of the increase in baseline usage. Because my concern is these numbers are all based on assumptions of increased utility usage that we don't have. And you're saying based on the savings of the increase in, in utility usage, that's how we're going to pay for the system. So, I, so, so I guess my question is: is the the sixty eight percent? You know, the first thing is the when we look at the um, January two thousand fifteen Energy Star usage, that shows a median EUI of one fourteen for schools K through twelve. You're saying though at the eighty something that we're sixty eight percent higher. But the actual, you know, th this is what I, you know, I only had this since Friday, so I went and looked at it. It shows the energy usage for penny is less than so. Well, I saw a different report that. Uh, that's 2015. That's the latest one that Energy Star has. That showed the Pedagogue was 90% high, you know, it was the highest or the least efficient building in, in the whole town. No, but John, what I'm saying is when you look at, when you look at this data trends, this is 2015, this was on Energy Star's website today. It says the median for all K through 12 schools is 114. In your report, you said Pettibone was at 87. So our, our, our actual energy use intensity is significantly lower than the median, not 68% higher. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I know yeah, I, I'm not trying to be on this. I want to no, continue the discussion next meeting. Question, and I, I mean, yeah, but I just want to pose to these this, questions so, so we can I, I understand. Have an answer from the engineer himself. I mean, that's so we got the cost absolutely. of the roof somewhere between nine hundred thousand to one point two million. Which has a whole set of assumptions built into that. But so ahead. what are those assumptions? I'll talk to him about that. Okay. So right now, your roofing system, which was done in tens of thousands of schools called as uh, Tacklins. Uh, so they're, they're basically panels. So a lot of what the roofing guys told us until you actually pull up a roof, you can't really see um, how much of it is actually damaged and how many sections. Um, being that um, 
it would be very more costly to rip all the tectum out than to replace it with new tectum. Um, right now, there's, you have to pretty much order what you need for it. And so it's, um, that's a little bit of the unknown. We don't know until you, you take the roof off. So you, you know, can't do that with like infrared or anything to see what panels are saturated? Um, no, that's my understanding. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, we're an energy company. We do, you know, we're not a bit. No, so we we're just asked for ranges, system. and I guess so. that's what you gave us 900 to 1.2. Right. So I mean, you know, feel comfortable, it would, there's no way it would be over 1.2. That's what we're hoping, absolutely, yes. <laughs> no, is that <laughs> what you feel comfortable, or? Right. Um, we're, you're asking us to make some serious yeah, decisions. Absolutely. So, um, do you feel well, comfortable? The analysis for either scenario uh, included the roof, so, so I think. But you're saying it's paid through the energy savings, yeah, yes. so we need to know our roof costs. Right, right. That's the numbers we were given. We were given about nine fifty, and then we had a contingency of a couple hundred thousand dollars in there. So, we so can we see what that is? I mean, yeah, as part of this exercise? Yeah, like what are the right. assumptions? How many of the panels are getting right. replaced? Ten percent? Thirty? Forty? Yeah, we can get that. Okay. Um. The. The and then, Paul, just so you know, we had two different, um, we had another engineer from UMass kind of shadow the other guys, and he came up with the same number. Okay. Is, so you so, can give us the assumptions that we use. Yeah, so, thank you. Or, the, no, no, I'm sorry, not on this. Both guys came up with the, you know, the before and after loads, independently came up with about the same number. I'm not discounting your loads. The I question mean, I the, have the is, end, the energy, energy Star is saying, our building is actually more efficient than the median. Your guys are saying it's less efficient, so I just want to know what database. You guys didn't reference the database. You just said the database. Um, they used uh, NREL and I think the US Department of Energy. Okay, so if we could just figure out, because that's okay. energy stuff. Okay. So, um, the 200 units, the, air, the baseline part analysis, 200 window units. You said about 200,000? You said 1,000 per unit? That's what we're so if we don't do central air and we do windows, we're at about a two hundred thousand dollar cost right. to add AC to the building today. Right. The if what if we were to replace the existing boilers in the piping system? Do we have that as a baseline cost? We it was it was kind of what I said to the gentleman before is that you're you're still on a loop system. Yeah. And it's like I had a steam system in one of my buildings and I got rid of it. And it was a little building, it was the cost of 17000 a year. Once I got rid of the steam system, I put a, a different energy efficient system. It went, mm -hmm. down, uh, it went down to about three, or 4000 So you're basically taking, you can put a super high efficiency boiler mm -hmm. system, maybe you get 10 or 20%, but what's your payback? It's still, um, we can get, uh, we're, we're anticipating getting big rebates and incentives to put the best system versus putting yesterday's system. But you're anticipating, you're saying the word that concerns, rebates and incentives sounds awesome, but you put anticipate before. So what what is the likelihood, what is the well, amount of rebates and incentives, and what's the likelihood of getting it? So the rebates and incentives are going to range uh, at a minimum of 20%, the utility rebates are going to range between 20%, and they could probably go up to about 35%. Some things like, you know, if you do multi-measures, which we are, you're then you can get a higher rebate range than just doing one item. If you did lights, you, you'd get you know, 20 or 30% only. Okay. By doing more measures, you get more money, which then will bring down you know, the cost of the system. Based on your scenario two, what's the anticipated cost of the light, the conversion to the LED? So the cost of the conversion is about, um, about 166, the rebate. 166,000? 166,000. And that's before rebate, Paul. Okay. So the rebate on lights could be 35 to 40%. Okay. Can you get us more I, detailed information on the rebate? I cannot. Um, the utility will not, until you give them an engineered package, they only give you ranges until, you know, so. So, so what's that ZREC application we're supposed to put in as part of phase one? So ZREC is if, if we decide to go through the project, uh, we will put in a ZREC application. Um, for uh, for the solar panels, you have one application that's in like two weeks, and then one that's next spring. So you basically have two bites of the apple, which you uh, talk about later. 
that you can uh, apply for. So there's two chances where you can win a zebra contract, with it, which would then lower your cost because it's somebody else's, you know, the utility is helping to pay for the cost of the system vis-a-vis the 15-year zero contract. Okay. The other way, the other measure you can do it is if you were doing the project yourself versus someone else, is that uh, we can monetize the tax credits. On the batteries, we can get a 30% tax credit. On the solar, we can get a 30% tax credit. Um, the 179D, there's, so those, those uh, uh, investment banks with Green Bank can help us monetize those tax credits, again, to lower the loan amount. But do, is a green bank? Is there a program in place with the green bank for municipalities? They're putting one in place now. We've been talking. Can we get for, for several months. from from them? Yes, absolutely. Okay. You can speak to Ben Healy. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt really quick. I just think since we're approaching ten o'clock, we might want to extend to ten thirty. Sure. Can I take a motion? So um, moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. And the tax credits is created for so whoever owns the system. So if the town cannot receive tax credits, right. it would have to be owned by a third party that would then lease back to the town. In scenario two, there was no preventive maintenance cost for the heating and cooling systems for the light. <clears throat> what numbers there, are you pulled for that? Well, there wouldn't be because that would be the LED lighting you're not going to have, you're not going to replace all the lights. They're going to last 15 years. So those trigens have no preventative maintenance? So the trigen, uh, yeah, we have, yeah, yeah. It, it speaks to how you structure the transaction. The owner of the system would absorb that cost. Okay. So that's us, right? Well, it depends on how, how we do this, and that's a whole other discussion. So that would double yeah, yeah, so yeah. So, so, you still so I, let's just take the scenario where a third party owns it. Let's just, for the sake of discussion. So a third party owns it. They set up an LLC or some structure. And they run it like a business. And they basically charge the town a certain amount to le essentially lease the equipment. And I'm, just, I'm speaking concept. I'm not trying to tag it to that exact structure. So, so the town would pay a fixed rate for that equipment, effectively. And then as part of that business model, the owner of that would take care of the system and do all the retrofitting and overhauls and things like that. So concept only. I don't need to So it. since we, the prior presentation, have these trigen units been installed in any more commercial? Yeah, so actually I think I forwarded you a video that they did a uh, microgrid system down in Houston on a 73, I think it was a 73,000 square foot building. Um, it was 144 kV of solar, uh, 600 tons of cooling, and uh, it was 144 kW uh, 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 trigen system. So what's the capital cost for the solar? So the solar is somewhere about nine about nine seventy five. Nine hundred seventy five thousand for the solar. Okay. And then what and, are and Greg, and I say this everything I say here is for the copy. We haven't these are rough numbers, we haven't. Oh totally out. I just want to get so, ballparks because okay. we're getting up right now. Um the heating and cooling systems, the Yanmar, the Trigen, Power Air, and the power air systems and heat pumps. What's the estimated capital cost for that? So the, the heat pumps, um, it's going to be, and this is pre-rebate, um, the total cost is about, about 600 for the heat pumps only. Okay. The m trident units and the package air, we have about another 240. Two, 240, yeah. so 600,000 for the heat pumps, 240,000 for the air handlers and the m trident. Correct, and that's pre-rebate. Okay. So, in the 970, 975,000 for the solar. And about 50,000 for the air, air ceiling, ceiling insulation. We got 166,000 for the lighting. Correct. And somewhere between 900,000 and 1.2 million for the roof. Correct. It's like a turf here. Um, windows. We didn't talk about windows. And we were not taxed with windows. Um, we. Uh, we're an energy services company. We can certainly get bids for you, uh, but uh, so the modeling didn't take into account if we replaced the windows with more efficient windows. Or? Well, my, our engineer said that windows, uh, like roof, it, it's a capital expense. So it's something you do once every thirty years, mm -hmm. and the 
the, uh, the payback on putting in Windows, although it's great, and it, it would save some, you know, some energy, I can't determine how much, but the, the, the cost of Windows would be um, not that, yeah. If, what's the right way to think? Uh, really long payback, yeah. I guess is the short answer. So it's just if the windows are failing, we should replace them, but right. otherwise stick with what we got. Or, or do a long term capital plan to replace the windows. Okay. All right. So I, I defer for right now because I, I don't have a lot of time to review it. Who's the best? Um, just a question of when you talk about the insulation of being about 50,000, where is the insulation going to be? So we're going to put in. Um, air seal and foam seal um, all the perimeters of the uh, buildings, the ceilings. Um, part of, although it's not called insulation, by eliminating, as you saw in the pictures, the skylights um, and some of the, a lot of the side lights, that, that will save a tremendous amount of um, if, you know, energy loss as well. And it'll help make the building tighter. Uh, I have a building that I had skylights, I put insulating skylights, new door, you know, just simple improvements. My building is toasty. You know, it's, it was always drafty and cold in the hallways, now it's not. So just doing little simple measures can save, uh, save tremendously. And when you were looking at the cost, was there any I'm thought? Sorry. When you were looking at the cost, you put about approximately 50000 to do that? That's correct. And that's a company that we've worked with before. They right. did a, um, my two projects in the interest that they did a phenomenal job. And have they done projects where the building has been uh, in the they, 1950s? Yes, they have. They've done hundreds, hundreds of buildings. That's right. Uh, U.S. insulation, they've done them. And was there any thought process when you are taking out some of the skylights? Would there be any asbestos stripping and any of that that's there currently that you'd have to take out and remediate? That would be part of, the roofing contractor mentions um, that as part of that, uh, some of the roof membrane had it, so they did, that was part of their bid. Uh, uh, they had noted that. Yeah. So that was included in the, the yes. roofing cost? Yes. Okay, thank you. Let me take say a couple of things, and then John. So it's finished, say, your phase one, these are kind of broad strokes. You, you got to the point where, you got a, a big vision of the projects. You've identified some costs, but you really don't have, you know, the rebates lined up. You don't have, um, you know, the financing terms and everything like that. So the next phase, and we do this in the library also. We started with a kind of general vision, and then we worked our way down to a design phase, and then we worked down to a construction phase to really nail in what the cost of the project would be. Is that what you're proposing to do next? So the design phase is phase two. And with that, you can not only nail down costs, but also the savings and the rebates and the financing terms, and to really get a better picture of what's being proposed. That's correct, and we'll be able to solidify, you know, uh, uh, the financing costs. The, uh, for example, the Green Bank won't won't give you an actual investment unless they have the plants. You know, uh, a lot of the uh, Ken and Armstrong and some of the other you know, energy finance companies, they won't give you. They want to see if you deliver them a complete, you know, engineered project. They will give you back, you know, financials and. Sure, sure. Okay, Mr. King. Um, just a technical question: by side lights, you mean windows that are? Yeah. So some of the um, some of the windows you have peeps. Yep. So, um, like I think it was on one of the legs you have uh, on the picture yet. Bring it up. So on the, the top leg, uh, for example, you, you see that those are two peaks. You yeah. have so that you have windows on the side. Oh, I get it. So probably you may eliminate a lot of those as you know put more insulation in. I guess that's like that finishing. Thank you, uh, Ms. Francis. Um, back to the green bank. You said back in phase one. You were going to seek the preliminary funding from the Connecticut Green Bank along with the rebates. So you mentioned that it's not available yet, or what was the. No, the, the money is available. Um, we were given broad terms about what they would, uh, they would give. They won't give an actual, they won't give you a letter of intent until they see an engine in your plan. So we did promise you we would get you into that, I think it was right. like 10% range. 
whatever I think right? I have to tell people, but so, that was part of the first phase, so you still right. intend to do that? That's that's what we're yeah, they flat out told us they're gonna develop the initial project around this. Municipal so why will we know that's part of what Well if Green Bank doesn't fund it, Hannah and Armstrong, uh, we talked to Washington Gas and Washington DC, a lot of people would would in effect either fund or buy this project completely because it's an energy project for many reasons. Because they, they could absorb the tax credits, they would um, So maybe Green Bank they're holding out to continue with them because they're you anticipate there'll be less cost? I mean, if there are other people that are so willing to do it, why are they... Why are they why they're, are they, why they're, why they're, they're not the only people we're talking to. We're talking to I many. see. Okay, so when phase one, you're here to talk about phase two. So when would you give us what you said you would give us in phase one? Will... I mean, you can't complete phase one until you complete phase one. Right? And that's part of it. I, I, I have to look at what it says, but I mean, uh, it's in phase number one, three. number three, yeah. aforementioned document, and maybe you go seek preliminary funding. But that was the one you just gave us on the card. Yeah. All oh, right, right, okay. So, so that's sort of a, yeah. sort of a large, not so I don't want to say component, but that's a, there's a little what if there, sort of large what if. Yeah, I mean, the Green Bank has expressed interest in the project, but until they know what the exact project is and the costs, they, they can't give us a letter of intent. I mean, well, it's, it's a chicken or the egg problem. How were you able to say you were going to get it? <laughs> That's what I'm asking you. Now I'm asking them, I'm asking you. So you put this in here as an item, and we paid you to do the phase one. So all the necessary interconnection agreements on the proposed recommendations. So. Yeah, I mean, you've taken it as far as we can take it from all these eight agencies. They've expressed their interest in funding it. The exact structure and, and the exact terms is unknown at this point. It's just, it's a chicken or the egg problem. We laid out the project to them, we told them what we were planning to do, they, they like it. Um, we okay, them. so then you really can't do this item in phase one, is what I'm saying. Well, I guess, you know, if, if you can, yeah. then you can't, but just say so. But it just means that you didn't. You're talking about number three? Yeah. yeah. To seek preliminary funding. I mean, we've essentially gotten an okay from the Green Bank. Have, no, it well, says, we it says it in other I relevant know, sources of right, rates. Right, sure. We've, got, we've gotten a preliminary interest from uh, Eversource saying it would be 25 or 20 to 35 percent. I mean, all these organizations are dealing with ranges until they know what they're dealing with. That's why we say it's a 900 to a million to range. Okay, so so we're say talking that. Way. If you offered to get this information based upon the information you were going to put together in phase one, so if they didn't get the information they need, you're the one that gives them, not us. So isn't that what you were doing in phase one, putting together this sort of thing here? And so well, that shows nice, but they obviously want more information. Right. Go ahead. Um, yeah, basically, and I'm, I'm remembering back to our conversation a few months ago, I did say that we have to have engineered plans to, because I remember the engineers standing there and saying that we would be in about 10%, and that's, I think with our numbers, our rough numbers, we are going to be within about 10% of the numbers I'm giving you now, Paul. Yes. That, so, um, but without having design engineer drawings, and I remember, you know, Tom even said, oh, people just give you bids. Yes, you can get bids, but until you have engineer drawings, people are not going to give you a hard bid. And the bank is not going to give you hard funding until it. But uh, so, my, my concern is, is phase one was to give us an idea of the capital cost. It appears you've given us a range of the capital cost. The second part of the equation was to give us an idea of the funding mechanisms and what the rebates and incentives were. Tonight, verbally, you told us some of them. It wasn't in the thing we got on Friday night. So it seems like you guys have a range of that stuff, right? For each of the solars this, Oops, the Trigen's this and the Yanmar systems this. Verbally, you told us most of them tonight. I think well, I just like I'd like to see how this all flushes out on paper. Okay, we can put that. We yeah. have those numbers, sure. Yeah, good. Like I said, this gets to be pretty complicated pretty quick. It's a lot of moving parts, so we actually try to keep it simple and let you guys throw out, throw out the questions. So we can absolutely provide some of that. Thank you.
is a motion on the floor to also move to phase two. What's up? Oh, okay. Let's entertain a motion and then have a discussion. Okay, motion for discussion and possible action on the disbursement of $40,000 from the Waste Management Fund for recommendations for phase two design and engineering. Second. Okay. Discussion. Uh, as we Mr. discussed, Master. I'd like to table it since we don't have the portion of phase one that was required. So I don't know how we can proceed with phase two if we don't have the numbers for that second half of phase one. What's the second half? The rebates and incentives, so we can see how the numbers actually work. We know the cost, but we don't know. See, I'm reading phase two also, and it says the final design plan will provide detailed descriptions of systems to be installed, mm -hmm. and will result in a detailed understanding of proposed cost savings and project cash flow. And I get that because it's like it is. It, it, we're talking about this with the library also. I mean, you know, but let's you just can't talk get about this one because it says right here in phase one, Mayor. If mm -hmm. you look at this, is the attack. This is the Stuff we got back at the prior meeting. Okay, I'm looking at the contract. Yeah, and phase one was the items listed that they were going to do for mm -hmm. the fourteen thousand, I believe it was, <clears throat> and that item is to seek the funding, which I understand they've sought it, yeah. but seeking it and giving us some estimate as they have in the cost. I mean, that's a that's a. So hold on for a second. I'm reading the contract to seek preliminary funding from the Connecticut Green, Green Bank and other relevant sources of rebates and credits along with debt and equity, equity financiers. Um, and then make some recommendations as to options available. Um, and then work with the utilities for all necessary interaction agreements. So for 14,500, we got some broad strokes as to, hold on for a second. This is the, the system that has been generally presented that involves a combination of solar panels on the roof, this tri-gen system which will generate electricity, heating, and air conditioning, as well as um, doing the, uh, the soft work to replace lighting and do insulation and things like that. So we have a broad stroke of a plan, and I think what they're asking for is to go to phase two so they could design it in more detail and get you know, not only the costs, but the other numbers. Mrs. Richardson. Do, I'm just wondering, do you feel like there are numbers that are available that you haven't presented that you would need time to present? Or do you think that you've presented everything that's in phase one? We have our numbers. So again, we try to keep this broad at the moment, but yes, we have our numbers. That's how we derived the 900 to 1.2 million. So there's nothing else that you'd be able to provide so you council. can't provide us a list of the rebates and incentives that are available? We can give you what our estimates were and what our assumptions were. Yes, well, we, we don't have that. Well, that's all I'm asking. Yeah, Mayor, no, we I understand that there's time and I understand about drawings and they need to be this or they need to be that in order to get to the certain segments they need. However, generally, in generalities, we're talking about the taxpayer looking at this and saying, is this a want, is this a need? Have you done your due diligence, town council? Mm -hmm. So I'm asking mm -hmm. a very valid question about something. I don't know what your contract says. I can only look at what we were given that we were told would be the contract. So I think it's only fair that they did their work to come up with plausible estimates of what they would do and given us alternatives. Mm -hmm. There should be the other half of that equation is, where do we stand with this? What can those? I mean, there's been, a, I understand it's not exact at this point, but we need to have something more than just to say, here's another 40. You know. I've, well, I, I get what you're saying, but yeah, most well, construction projects go in those stages. Okay, like but said, we don't have a contracts. tremendous amount of money to do a lot of more construction here, and all I'm trying to say is it going to hurt for them to get a little more information. We gave them that in the full faith that we were going to get the items that are listed here. And, you know, we hold some people accountable of what they write, and it's here. Uh, I'm Mr. just saying Bennett. I think yeah. we should hold them accountable. Mr. Bennett. Yeah, this is it going to hurt us to uh, put this off for a couple of weeks until the questions have been asked? The only thing that was concerning was you said the ZREC, you know, is due in two weeks. What's the <laughs> The ZREC yeah, application. The ZREC is if... If the town elects to move forward, you can put an application, which is you can send that contract. You don't have to go forward with it, um, or not, or you can apply in April 
Um, the only benefit is you can apply it. This year, you can, in effect, apply it twice uh, because you're in the large ZREC contract, which is a little bit more competitive. Um, uh, and hey Jeff, one thing I would say is, because that was included in phase yeah. one, you would so apply for ZREC. Z okay. So you could do the ZREC application and still answer okay. these questions as part of phase one. That was our part. If you're willing to do that, then yes. I think that would make Absolutely. sense and kind of take a little bit of the uh, urgency out of it. Can do that for a couple weeks for next Yes. Great. But that would well to push back. But granted, you submit it and then you still have to wait to, uh, <coughs> sure. to be selected. Sure. You, you sure. put sure. in a bid, course. and if you win the bid, you get selected for it. So do you need authorization? To apply on our behalf tonight, do you need to vote on that or so you can keep going on the phase one? That would be great. And can we also get really specific with what numbers that we uh, want from them just so right, we're prepared? As specific that. as possible, yeah, definitely. Were you asking them to so be I just specific know, yeah, or I just for John to be specific? Specific numbers that you want. Yeah, she's from asking you. What do you want? And then, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not 100% not, not sure what we're looking oh. for. Oh, okay. So we know what components are going to cost. We'd like to know what the Green Bank or other people would say and what those rebates, those are large rebates. So specific. So the breakdown of the assumptions, you know, where right. the money, you know, what the cost, the assumptions, the savings versus the usage, and, and so on and so forth. Um, Mr. Bass. Could you also, um, in the parties that you're talking to about the financing, could you also find out what the costs are going to be for the financing? Yes, and then we've looked at a few different ways of funding it. Right. Whether you own it or right. we're a third party owns it. Yeah, you could come up and give those to us as well. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Uh, fair enough. So let's take a look at two weeks, get some updated information, follow that ZREC application anyway, um, so we kind of preserve that. We don't have to wait until April. And. Um, We'll take it on then. Thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation. And it is a beautiful work already. You know, it's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, everyone's going. We got one more thing. He can't stay with us. Not me. I've been staying from that matter. So have a great night, everyone. See ya. Mr. Szymanski, uh, why are you leaving? Because I'm abstaining from the solar matter like I always have. Well, why? I think people want to know, they've asked me, why are you abstaining from the solar? Oh, because I've worked for them in the past, the representatives from that organization. Yeah. How much? You know, what, have, what have you done? Are there recommendations that you've made? I think it's important. We looked at the bottom part of the property. Okay. Yeah. So you have, what work have you done so that they requested from Amoresco or from the developers? I know exactly. We haven't done any, I haven't done anything on the, we did a, a concept sketch maybe originally on the solar thing, but we've, Done work on the lower portion of the property. Okay, so you need a concept sketch for the top part of the property, and like an existing condition showing an aerial and topo before they even Amoresco was really involved. So, I just out of caution, I don't want to be involved. Uh, have you spoken to any of your other town town council members about the matter, even if you're not voting on? Like in general, I mean, what he did for them before? Yeah. No. Well, have you talked about the solar projects with other members? Like what? Like just talking about it? Yeah. It's been a town council matter now for a number of issues, and now it's on again for discussion. I mean, anyone I've talked so, to, I said, I'm not involving myself in the matter. I mean, I've been crystal clear with all of them. every time. I mean, I you know. can ask them. Yeah, I don't. No, I know that you I mean, lives, whenever someone talks to me about it, But I have it, people, I said, and we're talking about responding to the community. They're asking me, why are you abstaining yourself I, I from, just, this, from this project? I understand. I'm trying to answer that question because I don't know either. All I know is that you're abstaining yourself. Which is my right. And no, it's your right, but people want to know. It's an important matter. They want to know where everybody stands on it and why. So you're abstaining because you were paid by the applicant or developer. I don't. I don't even know if I charge them for it, but I just. I, we had three people present tonight about ethics stuff. Why do I? I'm not going to participate in a matter when people are threatening all these. Ethics. I'm just no, being honest. I understand. This is the environment that's been created. And that's why, unfortunately, the full and disclosure. I'm not going to take any. Any chance in participating? That's and you should. That's simple. No, no, no. I appreciate but that's that why the disclosure is required. Have a great night. There's no disclosure. Sure, I can just I, abstain. I just, I just find it hard to believe that you don't know what the monetary, um, what you were paid for it. I, I have a hard time accepting that. So maybe you could um, look up your, go through your billing and look it up. Fair enough.
Okay, so we have a discussion regarding the Amoresco solar panel project. That was a request for that. Yes. Uh, as many of you know, it is before the siting council, and there is a public meeting scheduled for, I believe, the end of the month. 26. 26. Okay. I have a very simple reason for asking it to be on here. Sure. And again, it goes back to the people that we are that elect us to sit here. Sure. We, as a council, voted on the pilot program, and we know how that came out. You broke the tie. But what people want to know is each one of us, there were caveats at the time we voted. Some of us said we don't dislike solar, but we can't vote for this. Some of us said we don't want to cut down trees, but we really want to vote for this. It was, oh, and that was understandable. But what people really want to know is are you for it or are you against it? Very simple, yes or no. And they would like everybody that sits as a council person to answer that question. Can I say before I answer that, um, <laughs> I guess you can say anything. Thank you. I'm not, so I don't, and I know that there's information up on the siting council about uh, stormwater and re the removal of trees and, and everything like that. And I'll give you my exact reason for why I voted for the pilot pod project. But to, and to be honest with you, to tell you whether I am for the project itself or whether I was just for that specific vote, I think I would probably need to do more research in terms of the effects of, um, like I said, the removal of the trees and the, the stormwater. And that's what I mean, to, to give you uh, probably the answer that you're looking for, I can tell you the reason why I voted the way I did initially, but I don't think I could answer your specific question. Well, it's not me, but that's what or, people are asking that. It, yeah. Basically, just what you brought up. What the impact to the environment, the, the loss of the trees, the the wildlife, you know, indigenous plants, et cetera, et cetera. So if what you said before, you know, that's how you feel, that's how you feel. But I think it's only fair that we don't have any other method for people to, they can come to public participation, but we don't converse. They talk to us. This I didn't know how else to get this out there and let the people in the town know how everyone feels about this project. Let me say something towards that also, because I know that there are people against this project, and so we have filed, the town is a party at the Siting Council, and part of what we're doing is conveying to the Siting Council that there are people that have concerns about this project, about uh, the trees, and about the stormwater management, and we're conveying those, those concerns to them. We're filing interrogatories and we're expecting the applicants who are here tonight and, and, and are willing to answer these. Uh, I don't have a hostile position to them, but I have no problem conveying the concerns of a certain portion of the community to the siding council behalf, on behalf of the town, um, on behalf of the town. But on the other end, we also do have a pilot agreement that was neg negotiated and approved by the council. And we are making sure that the terms in that agreement are also uh, being addressed uh, before the siding council with the applicant. Um, so there's two there's two kind of different. I, I understand avenues. completely. We did vote on what we were, what was in our purview to vote on. We did it. I'm sure. And we don't need any more information from Amoresco, or maybe somebody does. Maybe they should make themselves available to the public. I was asked a very simple question: As council members who are elected to sit at this table. Can you say that you, similar to what we did with Pilot, you either think this is a, a positive program and a positive project to do, or you don't? Well, I think so the point was that... So you don't want to ask, you don't want to ask that question, you don't want no, to no, you, you could ask that question, but I think a lot of people have said, you know, the whole point of the Pilot program was that we had some general and preliminary information, and then the Siting Council is where those issues are going to get fleshed out and thought through, and that nobody really had made up their mind one way or another. I think everybody was skeptical, but, I but the risk. pilot yeah. gave the opportunity to at least have those studies done, appear before the siting council, the and be part of the process. The payment in lieu of tax had nothing to do with studies. Uh, okay, and obviously you remember that people here, such as myself, and Walter, and Mary Jane at the time, and Scott at the time, said that this was not the right place. There's, you know, you can love solar all you want. This wasn't the right place to do it. So the pilot program was what was put in front of us. Some of us voted for it, some of us didn't. We had, that was all we were voting on. Sure. You did send a letter on town letterhead. You and I have already talked about that sure. in this room, and uh, which we are really not charged with that. This is going to be on a private property. The siting council is come, coming, and they're going to make a decision. 
People who are against it and for it will have an opportunity to speak in front of them. But I was asked by people who voted for us and who will hopefully vote for us again, do you think this is a good use of this beautiful property? I don't want to try to sway it, but do you think it's a good project to put up? Uh, you know, what am I going to say, Frank? I'll put my plug in. Or not. It, that's it. It's a very simple thing to ask the people that sit here to say how, you know, Put your money where your mouth is. You but it's really like it not because there's a lot of misinformation. There I, I, go. I hate being I hate being the, the devil's advocate, but I and I asked Joel and, and some of the representatives to be here also because yeah, but that, no, no, no. Let me let me say something. I, mean, I, I can't keep my mouth shut, and this is why I, I don't care if I get reelected. I'm here to speak what I believe, and what I believe is the truth, and what is best for the town. And I believe that the process has value. And I believe that I should try to put people on the spot before that process okay. is concluded. Is disingenuous. I, I'm not asking you myself. You I'm are. asking you what people ask me. What you're and asking. You, well, that's my job, Mayor. Yeah. So I mean that we're all here for that reason. I mean, yeah. you have somebody ask you something, you wouldn't ignore it. So the point I'm making is if nobody here wants to do that, then I say to the camera and to the town, here's the answer of what you asked me to bring up. I sure. actually have no problem answering that if anyone wants to hear that. To say. So um, I think my initial concerns with uh, not allowing the solar project to go on there is in the past there have been uh, attempts to use that property for um, commercial purposes and if it's not used for solar I have concerns because the town doesn't own that property that it could be sold to someone else and, and they could decide to cut those trees down and using it for solar at some point may allow for those trees to be replanted. It may not be in my lifetime, but I hope it's in my children's or my grandchildren's lifetime, since I would hope that they would live here in the Milford as I have my entire life. Now, does that mean that that sentiment would continue in the future? I'm not 100% sure, because as I mentioned, I don't have the necessary information to make that decision tonight. However, if I do get that information, and I will do my best to do so within the coming days, if anyone wants to contact me, um, my email address is jrichardson at, I believe, towncouncil.org. Yep. Uh, and you can always uh, reach me there, and we can have a conversation. You can also have my telephone number, and I'll be more than happy to speak to anyone about uh, my decision. So sure. I d and I also don't think that my saying what I think means that anyone else at this table is obligated to voice their opinions either. Uh -huh. Thank you. Well, I will voice mine because I was asked. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry, I wanted to correct just one thing or maybe add something that you you'd said. Um, when the town became the part a party to this proceeding before the signing council, at that time the signing council had not yet decided whether or not to hold a public hearing. We sought a public hearing, and, and part of their reason for holding one was our request. I can't say it was because of our request, but right. as a result of our right. we added in a request for that, and that the Southern Council agreed with us and is holding a public hearing. That's a good point. I forget it. Thank you for pointing that out. The other, the other thing I wanted you, you to remember is it's not accurate to say that the pilot agreement is limited to the treatment of taxes. Sure. Because as you all know, and you all remember, there's also provisions that protect the town in case this facility is built. But on top of that, the pilot agreement has a unique feature which you shouldn't forget. If this project is successful and it gets, it gets ultimately built and it gets approval on the planning council and it gets built, then this developer has agreed to seek a voluntary relinquishment of the MPRDD zone, uh, which exists on that land now. In the absence of this project, that MPRDD zone probably would remain of record, and in fact, there are certain people uh, uh, mm -hmm. who have interest in this property mm -hmm. because they want to take title back with the NPR zone mm -hmm. in place. And so if you have, if you want to weigh the, town, the, ta that. the town's yes. interests, you need to think about solar development yes. against NPRDD in the future, and that's that I'll be quiet right there. And if we could possibly Fair just enough. extend it to five minutes. Yes, five. and I'll just say this, sure. is that five I have weighed all sure. options, John, thank you for that, that yes, someone could build there. I think that the pilot program is not the financial boon that everyone thinks it is. The material themselves put on that property, all that equipment would have probably as our tax assessor has said, a higher value over the 20 years. If someone wants to come in and build some houses there, we'll get some tax from that. That's another issue. Right now, I'm talking about this issue. 
And I have studied a lot of it, and there's a lot of stuff you can read, and there's a lot of things you can uh, discern for yourself. You're smart enough to see. Uh, there are lots of other places in this town that are not beautiful, not covered with, with trees and animals and wildlife and neighbors so close that this could be done. This is purely about money. This town will not see any benefit from this energy that could be produced here. The state of Connecticut will not see any benefit from it. I believe that it is solely a money maker for the developers. That's their right to do it. Uh, I am absolutely opposed to doing it there. If they found some rooftop or some other site that was a, like our brownfield or whatever, some sort of gravel yard, go ahead and put it in. I just am not, I'm not in favor of it at all. Fair enough. Mr. Mass. Thank you. Um, my sentiments are similar to Councilman Richardson. Uh, I think that new information has come to light, one of them being the state of Connecticut now has decided not to allow for deforestation for solar for solar farms. Also, the zoning commission here voted against. So I think there's a lot of information that has come to light that was previous to our agreements for the pilot program. And I think it's something that is very concerning. And I think we need to have more information that we've been given um, to make uh, that decision. But I think it's very, what has been come to light, and if it is true and in true fruition, this deal, I think uh, um, um, is a very tough one. Um, and like I said, I'm going to be doing my own due diligence more and more, uh, going to other meetings, listening to tomorrow night, to, to tomorrow tomorrow night, night yep. listening to more people and more experts. I think that's what we're supposed to be doing, uh, finding out. And if, in fact, that comes to light and it's not beneficial to the town, then we need to talk about that as well. Thank you. What would Thank you, you. What do you propose if you're against it? What is your proposal? Were you neg on the pilot? My proposal is, is to see what information that we do have, find out. I don't didn't see that as an option, but okay. uh, right. to me, it's, it it's, it's a, yeah, I, right, it's a contract. The siting council, for what, they are the be-all and end-all here, you know sure. that, and um, I think what people in town who care about this, to the plus and to the minus, wanted to hear is, you know, do we, are we really paying attention, are we really standing up for what we think? And that, you know, people still respect that, you know, uh, so. Miss Um. I have expressed this opinion before. I have, I do have a hard time with this property being clear cut for whatever reason. Um, but I see like we're almost in a catch-22 because if either we put in the solar, they clear the land, they put the solar in, or somebody is going to buy that property and develop it and it's going to get cut. I think either way, we're going to lose the trees. And that's my really big concern. Um, I think we're, it's kind of a dilemma. I think we need more information. I think we do need the expertise of the siting council and anybody else that's going to contribute to our knowledge of um, the whole project. And there's a lot of things we still need to know um, about where the transmission lines are going to be coming down. Oh, I have sure. questions about that. Um, and um, I, I really almost feel like we're in a catch-22. I think. Either way, we stand to lose the trees. Except and that I think it's people need to guarantee that. the trees will go if the solar goes there. But it's if you're gonna, if somebody's gonna, we know Mr. Like Dunham animal. was interested Not in necessary. developing that property. Like and my other concern is if it does go to development, is it gonna? Um, are we gonna be putting well, a lot more kids into our school system? Intensive. You know, there's gonna be a lot more, um, you know, cost to the infrastructure in the town <coughs> if there's a big, huge development <coughs> there. And personally, I don't, I don't see how they can put a development up there because it's on a big rock. But, right. Well, that's what I, that's, but, I guess that's how I wait. But there. somebody could come in and just, they could lock the property and clear it. They, they have that option. They could. So I, I think either way, we don't have a guarantee that those trees are not going to come down. But we do have a guarantee that the trees will come down if the solar put there. So. But I guess, I guess that makes a, a good point about you know, private property rights. And you know, what right do any of us have to None. say about what a landowner should do with their property. None, and I'm not a hypocrite. And when Mr. Dunham decided he wanted to make a deal for the condominiums with Vespera, I did not speak against his right to do that. I came and asked our planning 
uh, council to be considerate of the size that they approved, but I would never do that. I don't want you to tell me what to do with my property, and therefore I won't. And that yeah. can happen here. Unfortunately, we're going to have to extend yes, we're for gonna have five to. minutes. So, no, Unless anybody else has anything else that they want to add, I mean, I think the, the purpose of you know, the item is we've discussed it. And okay. there's more to discuss. And what I could say is that the town continues to advocate and tries to cover as many sides as possible and will note the opposition from people in the community. And tomorrow there is a, I mean, it's really information. Tomorrow at St. John's Hall, 7 o'clock. Um, and you can ask the questions and get both sides. Some of the, the developers are here. I mean, I would just invite you, do you have anything to add or are you just content to kind of go through the process? I'd give you the opportunity, but we haven't talked really substantive. It's more. Katie, are they going to be at the meeting tomorrow? I don't know. Are you going to be at the meeting tomorrow? We haven't been invited. No. I think it's a public. Who's hosting there? Uh, the uh, Rescue Candlewood Mountain group, okay. and uh, it's at St. John's. And as far as I know, it's open to the public. Um, I'm inviting you if you want to come. Yeah. I, mean, I would it think that would they would be invited. There are two sides to everything, and not. And I don't think it's fair to just bash something and not allow other people to, to have their chance. Because, you know, it's not for me to say that. I think and people are going to decide that there are facts, and, and I have sir, seen some misinformation already. So I would hope that you guys would come and, and set your version of the story so that we all have the proper information. I appreciate it. Mr. Barrett. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries.